Oyez, oyez, oyez. All persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the Court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Case number 20-5045, Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University, Committee to Protect Journalists, Appellants, versus Central Intelligence Agency, et al. Ms. Swain for the appellant, Ms. Wingle for the appellees. Good afternoon. You can start whenever you're ready, Ms. Swain. Thank you, Your Honor. And may it please the court, my name is Alexandra Swain and I represent the Committee to Protect Journalists. I've reserved two minutes of my time for rebuttal. So Your Honors, I'll say at the outset that this is an extraordinary case on an important issue in which the government has taken an illogical position. CPJ stands before this court as detailed in our briefs because a man was gruesomely murdered and credible reporting suggests that the United States may have been in a position to warn him. The American public is demanding to know what our government knew of threats to Mr. Khashoggi's life and whether they uh, fulfill their duty to warn him. And this is the exact type of case that calls for the public accountability that Congress intended the Freedom of Information Act to promote. The relief that we seek from this court is extremely limited. We're simply seeking that the IC elements confirm or deny the existence of documents related to the duty to warn Mr. Khashoggi, or at the bare minimum, for the government to meet its burden and logically explain their Glomar responses in light of a fellow IC elements public official acknowledgement that the United States had no prior knowledge of Mr. Khashoggi's killing and the CIA and the ODNI's position in the open society litigation uh, pending before the Southern District of New York. Uh, as you all know, the Supreme Court has held that- uh, Can I ask you a predicate question here? Um, you, you talk about um, the State Department um, and being a member of the uh, its intelligence community. Um, and uh, um, what I wanted to know is, is the State Department itself actually a member? It didn't seem to me that it's a member, that maybe it's, it has a bureau that's a member, a Bureau of Intelligence and Research, but the State Department as an entity, not actually part of this ICE group, as you call it. Is that right? The, so one particular bureau, you're right, Your Honor, within the Department of State, the Bureau of Research and Intelligence is a member of the intelligence community. Okay, but the rest uh, of the State Department's not. For obvious reasons, normally the State Department does not want people to think that all its members, all its ambassadors are part of an intelligence community. Is that right? But Your Honor, I will say that the deputy spokesperson um, was got up before the American people and uh, spoke for confirm? the Department of State. Sure, I want to I want to confirm the structural point, and that is that the State Department, as an entity, is not a member. It's only this one bureau within the State Department that's a member. The Yes, Your Honor, the Bureau of Research Intelligence and Intelligence is a member of the um, intelligence community. But again, the evidence that the State Department spokesperson or spokesperson uh, was speaking on behalf of the Bureau. I, I, you know, believe our, it is our position that the uh, Department of State, the official spokesperson for the Department of State, State was speaking more than just for uh, the Bureau of Research Intelligence. It was in fact speaking on behalf of the entire United States. And I'll just quote uh, the particular statement. The deputy spokesperson in front of our, uh, the American people got up and said, I can definitively say that the United States had no advanced knowledge of Jabal Khashoggi's disappearance. I know you're, I know you're Ms. Swain, you skipped. I'm sorry, go ahead. Please. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Okay. I was, no. <laughs> After you, I've already asked. So. <laughs> All yours. <laughs> I was just saying, Ms. Swain, I think you skipped the, the key six words before your quote, seven words before your quote. It, it's, it says, although I cannot comment on intelligence matters, I can say what you, you quoted. So I, I really didn't mean to interrupt Judge Millett's line of questioning. Right, and Your Honor, I'll, I'll say that I can think of nothing that's more of an intelligence, a matter of intelligence than a clandestine plot by a foreign government to kill a dissident. And so the Department of State can't simply uh, put out a facile uh, preface and just 
uh, erase the rest of its statement. It was in it, if it wasn't speaking towards an intelligence issue, how could it have said the United States had no advanced knowledge? And so, well, isn't it isn't it not unusual for press spokespeople of various agencies or various organizations to use a lot of words in order to say nothing? Sometimes that's their job. Taking judicial notice of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will respectfully submit. I hope, I hope none. Of, I hope judges do that less often than uh, you know PR people. But you know, it, I mean, isn't it possible that this this State Department person was asked a question? It was a sensitive matter, and part of their job was to answer it in a way that was responsive enough that the reporter would move on to the next question, but not so responsive that it gave away any intelligence matters. Your Honor, uh, again, um, that the intent not to. Uh, speak is not a recognized defense under the FOIA doctrine. And again, it, there's no other way to interpret this statement other than to speak on a matter of intelligence. And the statement inherently yeah, yeah, creates yeah, a- why wouldn't, why wouldn't the caveat that um, um, I cannot address intelligence matters at a bare minimum make clear that the spokesperson was not speaking on behalf of the Bureau of Intelligence and Research? Uh, because, um, Your Honor, the the deputy spokesperson said plainly the entire the that I can definitively say United States had no advanced knowledge, and the deputy spokesperson speaks on behalf of the entire um, Department of State, the Bureau of Research Intelligence included. And so, even if Your Honors don't find this statement to be an official, if somebody from the, if the spokesperson for the Department of Agriculture um, was asked by a reporter this exact same question and the spokesperson for the Department of Agriculture said uh, that same statement about, I can definitively say on behalf of the United States, this didn't happen. Would that bind, so this is someone who's not even remotely in the intelligence community, would that bind the intelligence community? Absolutely not, Your Honor, and that's and that's specifically not our argument. And so um, the you would the Department of State, the f preeminent uh, agency on foreign affairs, um, spoke on behalf of the United States here, um, and the entire United on States is on matter, but not on an intelligence matter, which is what this whole issue is about. Your Honor, um, your question was about uh, the Department of Agriculture and whether or not we can take that statement uh, to speak on, you know, matters with outside of its purview. And I would say absolutely not, Your Honor. The the four uh, the four government agencies before this court are members of the IC. They're members of the intelligence community. They're members that are all bound by the duty to so war. So if someone says I'm speaking on behalf of the United States, that by itself. Is your, your argument is that by itself does not bind the intelligence communities. Right, exactly. That not by itself, but when you have the speaking on behalf of the United States. I haven't oh, binds, sorry. I was gonna say only binds the intelligence community because a bureau within the State Department is part of the intelligence community. That's your theory. No, Your Honor. The te the the what we're positing is that when a member of the IC is purporting to speak for the entire United States um, on a matter directly related to a shared responsibility, a shared duty that not only um, is a shared duty, but it contemplates information sharing and collaboration. And when it's purporting to speak more for just itself, um, then that statement uh, is of the substance that it's in uh, the spirit of the circuit's precedent that to be able to apply this uh, limited uh, application of the public acknowledgement doctrine. And we do not, we we are not seeking, I will say on the record, we are not seeking to have this statement apply, apply to the entire uh, United States, just the IC elements before the court, the entire United States is not uh, before the court. And so this is a very limited application. And I'll also say if this court does not believe that it's an official acknowledgement, it is still contradictory record evidence that the district court should have considered in uh, contemplating the Glomar responses. So, you know, I can I can say contradictory record evidence and official public acknowledgement doctrine, because that's the doctrine. But I just want to take a step back, your honors, and, and just speak to in plain language about what the government is asking you all to do here. Uh, the government has said that to acknowledge there are no responsive documents is to acknowledge an intelligence failure, a gap in intelligence. 
To be clear, the entire world already believes that there is this gap because the Department of State official spokesperson got up before the American people, got up before our allies and our enemies. Ms. Swain, but Ms. Swain, if I, I'm, let me interrupt. I, I think there's something question begging about what you're saying, that the, the whole world believes it because the State Department person said it. But one of the questions in this case for us is, do we actually think that the world believes the State Department speaks for the intelligence community? And I, I thought of a couple of examples. You can kind of take your pick. But in the movie, The Sound of Music, there are six or seven untrapped children. Does the youngest Gretel speak for all the family, even though she is a member of the family? Duke is in the ACC. Does Duke speak for the ACC? If someone at Duke says, on behalf of the ACC, we think, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or if you're talking about the Corleone crime family, you know, does Fredo speak for the whole family? It seems unlikely. Well, first of all, Your Honor, I'm a dookie, so I like the <laughs> But um, I will I, I will address your questions. I say absolutely not. We're talking about the preeminent agency on foreign affairs um, that's a member of the intelligence community, and they were speaking, their statement specifically gets to a matter. That means that their statement, the United States had no advanced knowledge, would mean that there's no duty to warn for any of the intelligence communities. If that Wayne you, you've said a couple of times it's the preeminent agency for foreign affairs. Um, would you, and I agree with that, but would you concede that at least the perception of the State Department is that when it comes to the intelligence community, it is not the preeminent member? In fact, it's more like the, the Gretel of the Von Trapp family. Um, I will say that um, it is one of the 17 intelligence community intelligence uh, elements in the uh, uh, the director of national intelligence uh, is at the head. But the, to be clear, the harm that the government is contemplating here, and this is why this uh, statement directly contradicts the harm that the government is saying, is that people would know more by acknowledging the existence or non-existence of documents responsive to um our request, the, the American people would somehow know more about the gap in intelligence. I'm simply positing that that this statement contradicts that. Um, and again, you know, that is one piece of our argument. We uh, again maintain that it is official public acknowledgement. And I'll also just quickly point out one of the other logical gaps in the declarations that means this court should reverse and remand. So the government has- Before you get to that point, just one more question on official acknowledgement, which is, we seem to have precedent pretty strongly confirming Judge Walker's general instinct, which says it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether there are disclaimers or not. One agency of the executive branch can't officially acknowledge for another. And we applied that principle in Frugioni where um, the acknowledgement just seemed self-evident when OPM said CIA is maintaining the guy's employment records and CIA wanted to glomar the existence or not of the employment relationship. And same thing in more as between FBI and CIA, both of whom are under the umbrella of the intelligence community. Right. So uh, first, Your Honor, I'd just like to acknowledge I'm running up on my rebuttal time. So I'm happy to continue answering. We'll give you additional rebuttal time. We'll okay. Give you additional rebuttal time. Don't worry about that. Okay. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, so to uh, address the question, um, we believe that this is a matter of first impression for this court, and this court has not made so strong of a statement as to say under absolutely no circumstances can one agency uh, publicly acknowledge uh, for uh, another. And I will I'll go and answer your specific question about the Frugone case, because I think the Frugone case is miles away from this case. And so is any other case that this court has um, tried to uh, has has dealt with a similar issue. And so in Frugone, your honors, you have the Office of Personnel Management, where if you work for the government, you submit your tax forms, they work out your payment, the Office of Personnel Management, uh, the, their, their statement was uh, supposed to apply to the CIA on a matter of national security and national intelligence. And so in Flores at page seven, uh, or sorry, Frugone at page 770, 
At six, the court said if Frugone were right, however, then other agencies of the executive branch, including those with no duties related to national security, could obligate agencies with responsibility in that sphere to reveal classified information. And I respectfully submit that's miles away from the case that we're presented with today, in which, again, it's uh, an official statement by the Department of State, the preeminent agency on foreign affairs, speaking as a member, of, it, it, a member of the IC element, speaking on an issue that directly relates to a matter of shared responsibility on which all of the uh, IC elements before the court today are bound, and not just speaking for itself, but for the United States government. And so, um, you know, I think again. This is a distinct situation from Frugone, and it makes sense in a line with uh, the courts, uh, uh, in a line with Marino um, and, the, and the Center for Public Integrity to apply that reasoning here. While our facts may be novel, the reasoning that we're asking this court to apply is certainly not. Um, and are you done with that answer? Did you want to finish? I thought you could... uh, yes, and I will say the, 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 that for those reasons, this court should reverse and remand to the district court for... Uh... I have a quick question before you sum up. Oh, sure. That is, so the State Department was an original defendant in this case, and, um, uh, and then they've dropped out of the case. And I was a little confused in the brief as to exactly what happened. Um, did they, con I think there's a statement they conducted a search did they actually conduct a search and report the results? Yes, Your Honor. Um, so what the did they say when they conducted the search, what, 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 is, what, what was their report on their search results? So the Department of State did not issue, importantly, they did, it did not issue a GLOMAR response to our request. It, um, like the other agencies, answered uh, and, and produced documents about the first request, which is not an issue here, and then searched and went through a robust process with us going back and forth um, on search terms and searched and did not find any responsive records to the issues at, uh, uh, to the requested issue here. And that's exactly what we're asking. Hang, this on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I get that. Um, and so uh, um, they reported back that they had no records. Do you know if the search included the Bureau of Intelligence and Research? Was that explicit in their description of the search? Um, I will have to. I, I will have to go back and look. I, I believe so, but if uh, I would need to go back and, and look, and that's not um, in the record before the court. So uh, we're happy to submit a, a letter to the court explaining that. But um, only if there's something actually in the record that would make clear um, uh, whether the they searched the records of the Bureau of Intelligence and Research and then reported back no documents were found. Uh, I don't believe that's in the record, Your Honor, because we dismissed before uh, the summary judgment process. But again, I think I think highlighting the fact that the Department of State did not issue a GLOMAR response here, and they did that in part because of the statement that they made, is exactly what we're asking the IC elements to do. Well, it's only, uh, it's only, it's, so the rationale here, sorry. Oh, you go ahead. The rationale here, which is that um, the, a non GLOMAR response will reveal either um, what intelligence was being gathered or where the blind spots are, seems a lot more compelling as applied to agencies whose job it is to gather intelligence than it is as applied to the State Department. So the fact that the State Department didn't glomar this doesn't seem to move the ball very much for you. Right, and, and again, that's a reason why we dismissed the, uh, the Department of State and, and the Department of State's uh, you know, response to our glomar does not impact, again, as you're saying, uh, Judge, does not impact the burden that the government um, has here before this court. It does not impact their burden of justifying their GLOMAR responses. And I'll just point out a huge logical flaw that requires reverse and remand in their declarations, which is they've said that uh, to acknowledge the existence of documents about Mr. Khashoggi would inherently reveal something about an intelligence uh, source or intelligence method. 
Uh, they have not explained why that's the case. And so they have this huge logical hole in their in their declarations. That is, uh, they have not explained why information about Mr. Khashoggi is of the type, is of the nature in which just its mere existence would reveal something about the clear, source. Of clear. I didn't ask for just any information about Mr. Khashoggi before request thought it's on information about threats, aware a knowledge of threats to Mr. Khashoggi, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And advanced threats, obviously, um, before his disappearance. It, but that's not, so saying, if you had just said, do you have anything on Mr. Khashoggi, that might be a different matter. But the question was only whether you had gained information um, about a threat, uh, and in fact, a threat that you would have a duty to warn about, right? Uh, yeah, any threat, like threat of paper cuts or anything, or was it a threat? I thought it was a threat about uh, that would trigger the duty to warn. Right, Your Honor. I just want to clarify one point. Our our Glomar, or, sorry, not a Glomar responses. Our FOIA requests were um, about documents related to the duty to warn Mr. Khashoggi, so that it, that encapsulates a broad swath of documents that could be um, documents about, you know, could be documents about threats that would trigger the duty to warn, but it also could be after the fact assessments or um, again, uh, you know, as we put forth, it could be employees, you know, maybe speaking about, you know, Mr. Kokoji's case. And so that is exactly- In the, in the, st the test for having intelligence that might trigger the duty to warn is, um, uh, there's a phrase, I think, is it credible, specific and credible or direct and credible? Um, there's a test in the in the uh, um, the IC requirement on duty to warn, right? You have that's when you have a duty to warn when you have direct and credible or direct and specific intelligence. Right. What is yep. the phrase? Sorry, I thought I had it. I don't have it. I can uh, just grab it from the oh, credible. Cre well, it has to be credible, obviously. I think it has to be specific and credible. Right. That that is what the directive says, Your Honor. But again. Um, the, the, I just, the want to, doctor, I just want to back up here. You said, look, there's no reason your FOIA request would necessarily implicate intelligence for using methods. But if your FOIA request seeks only information about whether they had credible and specific intelligence, how would your FOIA request not necessarily implicate intelligence sources and methods? Only um, so, so our, our, I'll say at the outset that um, our, we've requested records about the duty to warn. That could be if the duty to warn is triggered and they have that credible uh, response, but it could be also after the fact sort of assessments and, and discussions about the duty to warn. But the, specifically, I agree, Your Honor, uh, with your statement that uh, if duty to warn records exist that would, uh, and, and those records were about contemplating whether or not to warn Mr. Khashoggi, that would uh, require there to be intelligence about threats to Mr. Khashoggi's life. However, the government- Any intelligence, it has to be credible, right. specific intelligence in the views of the intelligence agencies. Yes, Your Honor, but that, but uh, the, the, um, the burden here on the government is to explain why um, information about uh, threats to Mr. Khashoggi is of the type that it's mere existence. Um, we're at the Glomar stages, mere existence would reveal information about the source of that uh, intelligence or the particular method. So that's the gap here. It's not that it's not that the if documents exist, you know, we're necessarily chat. Oh, I think we are because we're, you know, we're saying that there could be after the fact assessments but we, uh, we understand that there could be some documents that are about threats to Mr. Khashoggi intelligence about that, but that's not the matter at issue here. Their burden is simply because we're at the Glomar stage to say the, the it, mere existence of that intelligence would reveal something about the source or method of that intelligence in which it was gathered. And that is the law that they have not met and that they have to meet their they have to meet their burden in doing that. That's their burden under the FOIA law. Okay. Uh, if my colleagues have no further questions, we'll hear from the government and then we'll give you two minutes for rebuttal that you reserved. Thank you, Your Honor. Sharon Swingle for the federal government appellees. 
Uh, I'd like to begin uh, where Judge Millett uh, left off, if I may, which is to point the court to the specifics of the FOIA request here, because I think it makes clear why it is that any non-GLOMA response would necessarily implicate intelligence activities, intelligence sources, and methods. Uh, the requester here sought records concerning the duty to warn under Directive 191 as it relates to Jamal Khashoggi, not the broader kind of request at issue in the open society case, but really specifically tailored to that duty to warn. And that directive mm -hmm. triggers a duty to warn only if an intelligence agency has credible and specific information indicating an impending threat to a specific person of intentional killing, serious bodily injury, or kidnapping. So necessarily, therefore, this request to the intelligence agencies would require an agency to confirm or deny the existence of intelligence relating to specific, credible, intelligence information about an imminent threat. So intelligence at a point in time about a particular person, Mr. Khashoggi or individuals who wish to do him harm. Uh, and the declarations provided uh, ample support as the district court found for the agency's Glomar requests here. And of course, those declarations are entitled to substantial weight under this court's case law. The ODI, I, I'm sorry? Your sentence, I apologize. No, no, please, Your Honor. Um, I ask you about the State Department, which apparently did do a search. Um, do we know whether that search included the Bureau of Intelligence and Research? So I do not know whether the search included that Bureau and there is nothing in the record about the scope of that search. Uh, my understanding from the back and forth with counsel is that the government took the position that the press spokesman's person would not preclude a GLOMAR, but that it was choosing not to GLOMAR. Okay. Um, are, and there's no sort of public record documents of what the scope of the FOIA search was? Not that I'm aware of, Your Honor. And I would just add here, obviously, the, the plaintiff here has not argued before this court that the State Department's ability to or willingness to search for responsive records somehow bears on the propriety of the GLOMAR responses by the intelligence agencies here. So I think in any event, that argument is waived. And then I had another... Sorry, did you have a question, Judge Kansas? No, okay. Um, I'm just trying to understand this. I understand GLOMAR how it generally applies in the intelligence community. And usually it's, you know, the whole point of GLOMAR is we can't say anything one way or the other. Harm to intelligence one way or the other. We can say nothing. But this arises in the context of a very strange exception and, and, and probably one for very good policy reasons. Um, and that is the very exception they're triggering here is one where intelligence communities share intelligence with third parties. Um, if the government had war or warned under this intelligence directive, warned um, uh, Pat Millett of an impending threat based on credible and specific uh, intelligence, and then Pat Millett's wanted to file a FOIA request, the same FOIA request here. And so I've already been given a briefing on this threat to me and on the intelligence, that intelligence has revealed this threat to me. And then I file the same FOIA request just to make sure I got everything. Could you invoke Glomer? I honestly couldn't say, Your Honor. I, you know, obviously the duty to warn does contemplate some disclosure of limited amounts of information for the protection of individuals, albeit without giving- You have no obligation to keep any of it secret. I, mean, it I, I, I don't know under what circumstances those um, information sharing, uh, that information sharing is done or whether there are commitments to, to ensure confidentiality. I simply don't know. Okay. Can I just, it's, and can I just add, Your Honor, it's also not clear, you know, if one part of the U.S. government um, provides information, would that preclude other agencies from invoking GLOMAR? Surely not. No, but right? I'm, assuming, I'm not talking about State Department here. I'm assuming the CIA or the Director of National Intelligence says we got to warn this person. And and documents are sought from those offices or agencies. Well, and, and the directive does contemplate that... Um, 
a person's warning might come from an entity other than the intelligence agency that has the credible and specific information. Well, I just that someone in the intelligence agency or the intelligence agency has told someone else about their intelligence and asked them to go tell this other person, all of which seems rather inconsistent with the principle both of Glomar and the principle of FOIA that if you tell one person, if you're willing to tell one person, you have to tell whoever a FOIA applicant is. That's what I'm, I'm wrestling with in this case. Well, and that's why I would be really hesitant to speak to the hypothetical, because in practice, I, I just have no knowledge of how those notifications are made. I do think, though, that it, it really highlights the danger of treating disclosure by one government agency as disclosure by any government agency. And I'm I think- saying, but I'm just saying, if you have, if the agency itself has adopted a rule that says, let's imagine they just sort of adopted a rule that says, we don't share intelligence searches methods with anybody unless we think an individual has been threatened, at which point we will share it with them. Um, if that was sort of, I mean, here I know it's a policy and they could decide not to share it. There's a standard in there for it. But if they just had a regulation that said, or a rule that said, without exceptions, if we get intelligence information on a threat to an individual, third party outside the government, we will share it with them. You couldn't do Glomars in those circumstances. Could you? Well, I, I think we still could under exemption three, because you're talking about the type of information that is also protected from disclosure by statute, right? Regardless of any showing of harm to the national security. It's protected from unauthorized disclosures. Correct, Your Honor. I've never seen here as a rule that authorizes it in certain circumstances. Well, and I think obviously the rule under the FOIA is disclosure to one person is disclosure to anyone, but I, I wouldn't necessarily transport that rule wholesale to disclosures made under Directive 191, where there is also, of course, a judgment made that disclosure to the threatened individual would not um, improperly um, undermine or disclose you know, sensitive national security That's exactly sources. That's exactly my point. You have a system of a rule in here or a directive in here, um, but if a, my hypothetical, it gets turned into a rule that says this stuff can be turned over in a particular circumstance. It can be acknowledged and disclosed. The ex existence of intelligence can be acknowledged and disclosed. I, I've never, I, I can't think of any situation in which Glomar has applied where the agency says, but in our discretion, we've adopted a rule that in a particular circumstances, we will in fact acknowledge and disclose. I, I, I really want to resist that suggestion, Judge Millett, because in fact, this court's case law, there are many, many, many cases in which the government initially withholds classified or statutorily protected information, and then as a matter of policy makes a subsequent judgment that it can and will release portions of that information. That's a completely different ordering. My ordering is they've made this disclosure in my hypothetical, they've actually made the disclosure before the assertion of privilege under Glomar. Your, your, your response was we assert it and then we decide not to uh, continue with it. We make a discretionary judgment not to do it. I'm in the reverse order. You've well, have made a disclosure in my hypothetical to a third party um, and yet you're still asserting Glomar. I would look back to the line of cases in which this court initially recognized the Glomar Doctrine. There were multiple cases involving multiple FOIA requesters looking for information about the, the project and the CIA's involvement in that project. And obviously the, the government ultimately made extensive disclosures. I, I, I'm not aware of the precise timing, but obviously this court held repeatedly that the government should not be penalized for its willingness to provide perhaps as a matter of discretion, additional transparency into secret government operations. The court recognized that principle in Larson. People there that the exact same information that the government had discretion there, with discretion chose to disclose would not penalize its decision not to disclose under FOIA? I just don't think it's a fit what you're talking about. Yeah, with all due respect, same Judge Millett, obviously no notification here has been made. And so this is, um, this is not the, the facts as it comes before this court. No, but wait, wait, what comes before this court is your directive and your, your, your simultaneous 
presence of this directive and a glomer assertion. That's what I'm questioning you about. And again, because the directive imposes no hard and fast requirement, no matter the threat to national security, to warn, I, I, I'm struggling to understand exactly why you think that the existence of a conditioned obligation, which is intended to nevertheless sufficiently protect intelligence sources and methods, would leave the government unable to invoke GLOMAR. I'll let you move on, but that's a caveat that's not in this directive. There's nothing in this directive that says that the disclosure will be done in a way that will condition the protection of intelligence sources and methods, and that there's nothing that says that we will obligate the person who receives the warning to say nothing. That's all. But anyhow. Um, uh, and I apologize. I was not precise, Your Honor. My, my point is that the obligation to warn in the directive includes exceptions where disclosure would improperly compromise sensitive national intelligence sources or methods or foreign government sources and methods. That's all. Can I go back to a question that Judge Millett was asking about the the request of the State Department? And maybe we can kind of logic our way th through, or maybe not, but if, if the FOIA requester asked for responsive documents from the State Department, which I don't know why they, they wouldn't have, and then the State Department provided or didn't provide documents and said, like, this is as much as the State Department is willing to give you and or is able to give you. And it didn't, if the State Department's, I guess I can't, would it have been legal for the State Department to not tell the plaintiff here, we searched everything except our intelligence office, but we didn't search that because you're not allowed to have it? In, in point of fact, my understanding is that the State Department took the position that while its press spokesman statement, and, and frankly, to my mind, it's an extremely ambiguous, um, internally incoherent statement that doesn't disclose anything, but that that statement didn't preclude it from invoking a GLOMAR, but that it chose not to. Okay, but that's not that's not my question. I, and I, I'm sorry, I phrased it in a very confusing way. Let me try again. The, the plaintiff here, uh, my First Amendment, goes to the State Department and says, I want the following records. And the State Department doesn't invoke GLOMAR. And instead, the State Department provides them with some records, or the State Department says, we're not providing you with any records, and here's why. When the State Department does that, wouldn't the State Department have had an obligation to tell the plaintiff, we are not looking for documents in our intelligence office, if in fact the State Department did not look for documents in its intelligence office? I think that State Department would have had an obligation to complete a, a comprehensive search for every place reasonably likely to have responsive records, okay. not knowing the scope of the actual search in question, which I believe was in part negotiated between the parties. I can't speak to more than that. Okay, no, that's, that's responsive to my question, so thank you. I do think, though, that the fact that the State Department might have come back and said we have no responsive documents sheds essentially no light on the validity. And again, putting to the side the fact that they have not argued this, that the plaintiff has not argued this, that it sheds no light on the validity of the GLOMAR as to the other agencies, because there would be no reason to think that the State Department would have any knowledge of the existence or non-existence of responsive documents as to the other agencies. And just turning to those, I'm sorry, Judge Katsas? On, on official acknowledgement, Marino seems to stand for the proposition that one component of an agency can officially bind and um, for, for official acknowledgement purposes can, can bind another component of an agency. Um, why shouldn't we treat the intelligence community as an agency for these purposes. It's a pretty well-defined group. People think of it as a substantial degree of coordination. Um, 
It's a lot more than just some ad hoc task force. Why shouldn't we treat it that way? Well, I have a couple of answers, Judge Katzis. First, I think it's just flatly inconsistent with this court's case law and more, as you pointed out in your earlier questioning, the statement by the FBI was deemed not to be an official disclosure on the part of the CIA and obviously both the FBI True. and the CIA. True, but without expressly addressing this um, complication for your position, possible complication. Well, second, I think the argument just proves too much and, and really is inconsistent with the way this court understands official disclosure. True, the intelligence community does uh, in some way coordinate their activities, but the exact same executive order that the requester points to here, Executive Order 12333, also directs every executive branch agency to coordinate and work cooperatively with the CIA to provide national security information intelligence to the CIA. And obviously, all executive branch agencies, or at least, you know, perhaps excluding the independent agencies, all other executive branch agencies are intended to work cooperatively uh, under the auspices of our unitary executive, the president, presumably with the president playing that coordinating function, you know, as mediated through the National Security Council. We wouldn't think that any executive branch agency, or at least this court has consistently held, that any executive branch agency can't officially acknowledge information on behalf of any other. And yet that same logic would seem to flow given the president's sort of. Yeah, but that, I mean, that's one level of gen generality up from where we are with. Well, okay. I don't believe so, Your Honor. I, again, you know. I mean, the, entire, the entire unitary part of the executive branch. Well, the, the sort of coordinated role that the requester here points to is either under 12333, which does not oblige one intelligence agency to share information or you know, uh, make sure that every position it takes is consistent with that of every other IC. It does provide for the ODNI to mediate certain types of disputes, but it doesn't have some kind of formal coordinated single role that they play in tandem any more than the fact that the NSC might mediate a dispute between other executive agencies. Was well, the Director of National Intelligence the head of this intelligence community? Uh, the, the ODNI plays a, a coordinating role, yes. So if the Director of National Intelligence made the disclosure, made a disclosure um, of credible and specific intelligence information, made publicly a disclosure, Terrible and specific intelligence information about an individual. Would that bind the CIA? I think that would be a harder question, particularly as related to Directive 191. Yes, I, so that's why I'm asking the question. So, Do if I can. How this sort of networking, this relationship here, um, I, I get your argument about the State Department. I'm trying to just figure out whether within this network, there is at any point someone who would have enough authority to waive it for other members. So as it relates to Directive 191, which is what I understand your question to be focused on, Directive 191 envisions that the ODNI will resolve any interagency disagreement about providing a warning. So the fact that the ODNI that's had different. Isn't that different? Because then that, that it could still be that um, then the individual agency would still be in charge of making the warning. I'm asking a different question, and that is within this intelligence community, if the DNI just made a disclosure, if it helps you to get away from the scenario, scenario that's fine. The DNI makes an intelligence disclosure that implicates the type of intelligence that both the NSA and the CIA uh, would also be involved in uh, collecting. So the DNI makes a disclosure. An authorized public disclosure of intel specific intelligence information. And the CIA has that same specific intelligence information. Could it still do a glimmer? I think it would really turn on the facts, Your Honor, but Judge Millett, just same to- information by both of them. Does the DNI have the ability? I get your argument about State Department. 
I'm just saying, does the DNI, is there anybody within this intelligence group, and I'm starting with the DNI, have the ability by their disclosures to bind in the same way that, um, you know, an FBI disclosure could bind another part of, uh, another entity that's a part of the Justice Department? I, the, the, and I'm not trying to be difficult, Judge Millett. I think the, the resistance I'm having uh, is that this court has repeatedly recognized that the fact that a particular IC entity is operationally engaged in a region with a foreign government in particular intelligence sources and methods might itself be independently significant. And so, you know, if the ODNI discloses intelligence information, but not the particular government entity that might be involved in collecting that intelligence agency, would that preclude, for example, the CIA from uh, invoking a GLOMAR? I don't believe so. If the CIA the could... Of any additional particular... Because essentially what happens in your scenario is there's still an extra bit of intelligence information that hasn't been disclosed by the DNI doing it. That's your theory that the, you know, who, who is doing the collecting could itself be protected. If there is no additional security information... Uh, or if, the, if the OD... I'm sorry, Your Honor. No, no, sorry. I'm just trying to clarify a question because I, I appreciate your response. Um, but if there is no, no increase, there's no change in what the protected information is between what the DNI is holding and the CIA is holding and the DNI's disclosure disclosed who has the information in the government. Would that preclude the CIA from doing? Criminal? So I think the concern I have is I don't think the ODNI stands in the place of kind of a parent entity in the same way that, for example, the president stands as a parent entity for the CIA. I think the ODNI plays a coordinating role, but does not, you know, the CIA does not directly report to the ODNI in the way that this court envisioned, for example, in the ACLU versus CIA case, where the court was talking about statements by the president, the president's senior counterterrorism director at, at the instruction of the president and the CIA director, you know, and the court there envisioned that it would be either an authorized representative of the agency or a parent above the agency. And I think the ODNI stands in a somewhat different role um, here from, from the president or the senior counterterrorism advisor there. My colleagues have any further questions? Mm. Okay. Thank you. Ask the court to affirm. Thank you, Your Honors. Ms. Swain, we'll give you two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll just tick through some of the government's um, arguments, some of your questions. So, um, Judge Millett, to your question um, about the way that duty to warn documents would come about, our specific request was about records concerning the duty to warn under Directive 191. And it wasn't as specific as to say uh, records showing whether or not they warned Mr. Khashoggi. So that could encapsulate after the fact sort of assessments or um, things. Um, also, the uh, your your honor's line of questioning, um, the court's line of questioning about um, the bearing of the state searches on the uh, on the IC elements before the court. I maintain that it has no bearing on the government's burden to justify its Glomar response here. What what the searches that the uh, Department of State did, because the Department of State specifically did not issue a Glomar response. It acknowledged they had no documents. Here, they have issued a GLOMAR response. So we're just asking them to do the bare minimum that acknowledge whether or not there are documents. Um, and I believe uh, the government has said uh, in their uh, statement that just now in the argument that there was no notification has been made. So that seems to be be an, an uh, admission that they did not warn Mr. Khashoggi. I, um, I'll also say just in the brief seconds that I have, we, um, we believe that this case requires reverse and remand with instructions for the IC elements to acknowledge the existence or non-existence of documents, or at least for them to meet their burden and submit more detailed declarations um, that could be reviewed in camera if necessary, if it has uh, sensitive information. That's a, an option that the court can totally take. Um, 
Alternatively, this court at least could just reverse and remand to the district court saying district court under the summary judgment standard, you should have considered all of this uh, contradictory evidence on the record and you should do that on remand. Uh, there's just too much to use the technical term, too much fishy going on for the court, for these uh, Glomar justifications to stand here. Um, and that's why we think this case revi requires reverse and remand. Thank you very much, counsel. The case is submitted. Case number 20-5091, Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and Associated Press Appellants versus Federal Bureau of Investigation and United States Department of Justice. Ms. Townsend for the appellant, Mr. Busa for the appellees. Ms. Townsend. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. As you know, there are two issues presented in this appeal. First, whether the FBI has met its burden to demonstrate that the records it has withheld in whole or in part pursuant to Exemption 5 fall within the scope of the deliberative process privilege. And second, whether the FBI has met its burden to demonstrate that it is reasonably foreseeable that harm to an interest the deliberative process privilege is intended to protect would result from disclosure of that material. Because the district court's grant of summary judgment to defendants should be reversed on either ground, I'll start, Your Honors, by addressing the, the second issue, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the first during the course of my argument. Uh, contrary to defendants' arguments, the foreseeable harm provision that Congress added to FOIA in 2016 made a consequential, meaningful change to the act. Now, under FOIA's plain language, where disclosure is not prohibited by law, agencies are required to disclose records under FOIA, even if they fall within the scope of an exemption, unless the agency can demonstrate that it reasonably foresees that disclosure would harm an interest protected by an exemption. That means in the litigation context, an agency must demonstrate in a manner sufficient for the court to conduct an over review, not only that exemption five applies, but that it's reasonably foreseeable that disclosure of the specific exempt material that the agency seeks to withhold would harm an interest that exemption five is intended to protect. Ms. Townsend, um, let me ask some questions about what you just said. Um, in, in the court's Machado opinion, um, it describes a government affidavit on a FOIA request. And the affidavit says that disclosure would discourage attorneys from candidly discussing their ideas, strategies, and recommendations, thus impairing the forthright internal discussions necessary for efficient and proper adjudication of administrative appeals. And that was enough. Um, so applying that standard to the facts of our case, what, what more do you think the uh, government needed to do here that it didn't do here? And I think, Your Honor, that Judge Katz's opinion in Machado Amadas, it's distinguishable. It's very instructive in the way that it's distinguishable. At issue in that case was one type of record. Here we're dealing with multiple different types of records, including, um, you know. Let me, pa let me pause there because that, that is part of my question is whatever the government needs to do for category one in our case, if that same explanation applies to categories two through six, is it okay for the government to repeat its exact words and simply copy and paste what was good enough for category one and then say for category two, the same thing and for three and then four and then six? So let me answer that. I have two points to make in response to that, Your Honor. First, I think um, 
and, and, I, and I'm not trying to dodge the question, but I will say it depends on the on the nature of the specific documents at issue. We can talk. I can. Well, that's if, that's actually helpful, though. Can we just right. make, to make sure I'm clear on this. So there are occasions where that would be enough. I think and I think I'll, I'll I'd like to talk a little bit more about Machado Amadas because I think it's it's helpful to exactly this point, because the but opinion. Can you, can you just help Amadis, me with the clarification? I just I'm trying to understand what you answered before that there are occasions where it would be enough to copy I think, and paste. I, I think it's, it's not a question of copying and pasting. It's a question of whether or not the, the harm that's being identified by the government is tied specifically to the types of records at issue. So if you have records that are very similar, sure, you could cite the same harm, but you have to, you have to tie that harm and actually explain how the harm to be protected by the deliberative process privilege, which is the, 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 the quality of agency, agency decision making, how that applies in that given context. And that's not what we saw here. And I would, po I would point your honors to the Waller Declaration, for example. Um, there's one paragraph, that's paragraph 20. Sorry, can I just back up for a second? Of course, Ron. So the copy and paste thing is uh, maybe not the best language for this foreseeable harm exception, because I just want to make sure I understand what your answer is. And that, my understanding is that they're required to make a particularized judgment. Um, now the harm, the ultimate harm, when they make that judgment and they particularize it to a document or a group of the same category of documents, as long as they've made that particularized judgment um, and the harm is uh, you know, laid out in detail to the deliberate process privilege and they may not have, it could end up being the same words but the they can't, they can't just cut and paste. They've got to make the individualized judgment uh, each time. And as it happens for the same, for some types of privileges, the type of harm is likely to have be described in similar words. Words, is that what you were saying? That's correct, Your Honor. And I apologize if I wasn't clear in responding no, to Judge Walker's question. My listener was not clear today. <laughs> um, it is a particularized showing tied to uh, the specific nature, the specific records that the agency is withholding it. And yes, there are only a few purposes that this court has identified that are served by the deliberative process privilege. So of course the agency is going to be referring to specific, those specific purposes, I think with respect to different kinds of documents, but what it can't do, and I think what it has done here is name all the purposes that the deliberative process privilege is May, may serve um, protecting uh, the candid nature of a subordinate's communications to a, a senior decision maker, for example, or confusion to the public. All of those that have been applied by this court in different circumstances and say, these are all the purposes that the privilege serves. And we're gonna withhold all of these different kinds of documents um, because one or more of those purposes may be undermined if we disclose one or more of these documents. And I think if you look at the materials that were uh, released mid-appeal by the government in this case, after our opening brief was filed, you can see examples where this just completely breaks down. And um, I was pointing to the, the provision in the Waller Declaration, paragraph 20, which is really this umbrella paragraph that really speaks in very general terms about the purported harm that would flow from disclosure. And so I'll jump to the middle of that paragraph, but it effectively says to require disclosure of the withheld information would prevent OIG from engaging in meaningful documented discussion about policy matters in the future, which could have a negative effect on agency decision-making and would potentially confuse the public about the reasons for the OIG's adoption, uh, for the OIG's actions, excuse me, in this matter. It would also reveal the thought and decision-making processes of the OIG and may not reflect the agency's decisions. So that rationale um, was proffered by OIG with respect to a multiple different types of documents, including documents we now know, if you look at Joint Appendix 494, which is one of the documents that was withheld in part previously, released in full um, during the course of this appeal, um, the agency proffered that rationale to withhold a single sentence, completely factual in nature, uh, about that, that indicated that the OIG had provided a draft report to the FBI at one point. Um, and so I think this is why there were, and I, and I think at this stage we would say there's nothing deliberative, there's certainly nothing pre-decisional about that document, that's the memoranda that was, that was attached to the final OIG report. There's certainly nothing deliberative about it. And the notion that any harm to the agency's 
the quality of the agency decision-making process, which again is what the deliberative process privilege is designed to protect, is untenable. Um, any any argument on the part of the government would be untenable. And I think that's why they released it mid-appeal, but I also think it illustrates the fundamental um, lack of sufficiency of the agency showing on appeal. And just to, to point, I'm sorry, go ahead, Your Honor, Judge Katz's. Isn't it fair to think that the robustness of the necessary explanation on foreseeable harm would sort of it would depend on the category, it would depend on the sensitivity of the documents we're talking about, right? If someone makes a FOIA request for the nuclear launch codes, you wouldn't need a really long explanation on foreseeable harm, right? So that's that principle helps you on many of these categories, but let me press you on one that seems to me a harder one for you, which is the Comey emails. Um, You've, you, you know from context that the agency has this problem on its hands. It's significant enough that the director of the agency feels like he has to write um, to the New York Times, which doesn't really happen every day. Um, sensitive subject matter, PR debacle, I mean, isn't it pretty obvious from the context that deliberations with regard to that kind of document implicate the, the interests of the privilege and their release would harm the interests that the privilege protects? I would say no, Your Honor. I think um, not all discussions um, are deliberative. Sometimes decisions are made without deliberation. And I think that's one of the reasons why this court's case law indicates that you look to where in the chain of command the communications are coming from and where they're going. And when we're talking about uh, former Director Comey's communications to people who worked for him, um, we don't know what those communications say because they've been redacted, um, but it's, it's very reasonable to think um, on the face of those documents, and particularly without any additional showing, that what former director Comey is doing is explaining a decision he's made or directing someone who's a subordinate to him to um, carry out his 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 um, instructions. And so I think that that's why the, the deliberative application of the deliberative process privilege itself is very fact specific. And as you noted, um, Judge Katzis, I think it's correct to say that the the sort of the the showing that the agency makes with respect to the application of the deliberative process privilege um, does have a does all is also interrelated with the foreseeable harm right. analysis. Right. I, I thought it was pretty clear. I'll go back and look at the documents, but I thought it was pretty clear that he was providing comments on a draft letter. I think there are. Uh, it's. It may be clear to you, Your Honor, was not clear to us. It appears that he is providing information or direction, again, that's redacted in redacted form to subordinates, which again is relevant. And I think it also goes to the foreseeable harm question, because even if the document is delib deliberate, even if it's is, is, that, is that inconsistent if uh, uh, Mr. Comey is providing comments on a draft letter? Um, and you're saying, well, it looks like he was providing directions to a subordinate, but if the directions are make these edits to the draft letter, you're both the same in the description, but the one seems more um, squarely within the deliberate process privilege, right? If the directions are, let's make these changes before we announce this position, that would definitely still be protected. I would think, Your Honor, that that it depends on the the, the the context, but it could be that the decision is already made and that Judge Comey is, or Judge Comey, excuse me, former Director Comey is just instructing his subordinate to on what the decision is he has made. And again, because we don't, that information is redacted, it's not, it's not, that's not clear. Um, but again, I would agree in principle. Sorry, go ahead. Finish, please. Sorry, finish. Uh, I would agree in principle that there are certain types of material, and this court has re recognized this in coastal 
states, for example, that um, there are the there's the classic case of the deliberative process at, at work. And that is a subordinate attorney, for example, um, providing advice. And I think this flows into the Judge Katz's decision in Machado Amadis, I think it, it's very consistent. There are certain types of decisions, line attorneys, commentary to their senior attorneys or providing legal advice on specific matters that's at the core of the deliberative process privilege. And perhaps the foreseeable harm showing is different or less rigorous than it must be for a situation where the records at issue are not the kind of decision that the deliberative or decision-making process, that the deliberative process privilege is really geared towards? What does our PowerPoint um, presentation, how should it be organized when all it does is um, repeat existing policy? And that is certainly what we've seen from the, from the slides that were released at Joint Appendix 500 through 513 mid-appeal. Um, publicly available information, how are we going to organize that for a PowerPoint presentation? That's not the kind of decision that the deliberative process privilege is geared towards protecting. And the notion that the agency has to do more to demonstrate that that, that harm will flow from disclosure of that information, I think is is common sense, quite frankly, um, but I think it's also consistent with this court's decisions, as well as the way that this, the foreseeable harm provision has been applied, not only by in Machado Amadis by this court, but by the district courts as well. I see that I've run into my rebuttal time. Um, don't, worry, don't, worry, don't worry about that. Can I ask you a question on, on the, the comments um, uh, or, or the, the documents as the communications as they're developing this editorial? Um, how do you distinguish the Krikorian case? I think, I think that there's no case law that indicates that pub, that media strategy in and of itself, sort of quote unquote media strategy documents in and of themselves are necessarily, just by virtue of being media strategy, are exempt from disclosure under the deliberative process privilege. And I think if we look back at the pre-foreseeable uh, harm cases um, like coastal states and other cases that look at the, that focus on, that don't collapse the distinction between pre-decisional and deliberative, you, you can see that. And I, and I do think that there is a strong distinction. I think it is an important factor that with respect to these documents, it is not a subordinate providing commentary, at least as far as we can tell, providing their indep independent candid advice to Director Comey about whether or not he should um, write a letter to the editor, write a letter to the editor of the New York Times it is uh, Director Comey telling his subordinates the decision that he has made. And so the, the protect the harm of discouraging subordinates from providing candid advice to their superiors to aid in, in um, policymaking or decision making, it's just not implicated there. And so I do think it is different and it has to be looked at at a case by case basis. So you make a, you make a fair point and I, I had Machado very much in the back of my mind. You make a fair point that it could be different when the deliberation is running from the superior to the subordinate rather than vice versa. But even so, I mean, you could imagine a lot of circumstances where the component head is trying to figure out what to do. And of course, he has the final decision making authority, but he wants to bounce ideas off of people. Um, you could also imagine a situation where he has made the decision to take the strongest case for you. And he says, take, take, take out the sentence that says X. And it turns out X is a really dumb idea. And it you know, would be embarrassing if that proposal were disclosed. I mean, it just do doesn't seem all that different to me, this, this kind of thing from the category one documents from what we had in Machado. Well, what I'll say, Your Honor, is that we're not taking any kind of categorical position, actually, as to concerning whether or not there are specific types of documents that should that that absolutely cannot be protected, subject either to the deliberative process privilege or that meet the foreseeable harm provision. Well, our position is the agency hasn't made that showing here, and I think if if all um, and that they would be required to, and perhaps they could on remand. I, I, I understand, but I'm just you know, J Judge Walker opened by saying that. The agency declaration in Machado was relatively short, but 
part of the reason for that might be that the um, sensitivity of those documents was pretty apparent and uh, maybe the sensitivity of the uh, Comey comments is similar in degree. That's that's all I'm saying. I, I would warn your honor that I think that the the court's conclusion in Machado Amadas, and I think this, it, at least to my eye, is, well, is, is evident from the, from the opinion itself, is that um, it was a certain specific type of document. So they're not multiple types of documents. And um, they were what the court um, what was consistent with what the court has found to be really at the core of the classic case core deliberative process material, which may require not the same kind of showing that other material, including some of the material we're talking about here, would require. Okay, thanks. My colleagues have any further questions? Ms. Townsend, we'll give you a couple minutes on rebuttal. So, Mr. Is it Busa or Busa? I apologize. Uh, Busa, Your Honor. Good afternoon, and may it please the court, Joe Busa, on behalf of the federal government appellees. I'd like to start with what's occupied most of the discussion this morning, which is the, the second question presented here, and the requirement the agency reasonably foresee that harm would result from disclosure. And this requirement um, requires the agency to consider the specific information at issue in the case, Machado makes that clear, and then um, to link that conclusion to the interest protected by any given uh, FOIA exemption. It doesn't narrow the types of interests protected by the FOIA exemption, nor does it raise the degree of harm required before the agency can withhold the information. It takes- I just wanna, I wanna, I wanna push a little bit on. It's, it's, it struck me a little bit odd that <clears throat> um, you treat it like, you know, you apply the FOIA exemptions, go through all that, and then we go apply this foreseeable harm, harm thing when <clears throat> apart from <clears throat> the parts to which the foreseeable harm does not apply. So um, say exemptions one and three generally foreclosed by law. It seems to me what the foreseeable harm did, provision did was put into every other single, every other exemption, an additional prong, right? Because you have to apply it to every exemption decision. So we should now understand the deliberative process privilege to have its usual elements. Plus, you must make this particularized document or document category judgment. And as we said in Machado, that the information would, would uh, cause the harm protected by that privilege. And we know from FOIA that the difference between would and could is actually material between exemption six and seven C, for example. Um, it's a higher standard to show that a harm would happen than that it could happen. And it seems, so it seems to me that in fact, um, there is that to that degree an adjustment in how deliberative process is looked at. It's not enough now to say, um, we do this stuff sort of deliberately in advance and so, and it could be bad if we disclose it because it, it could chill people. Uh, that you actually need to say that the nature of this document, this deliberate, which may well then be the nature of this particular deliberative process in this circumstance would. Am I correct? That's I how think, that works. yes, Your Honor, we agree with that outline here, but just to highlight a few things uh, that, that flow from that. The first is that the agency is making a predictive judgment about the effects of disclosure here on future similar deliberative processes. That's not readily susceptible to documentary evidence. It's hard to see what the agency could do to prove that judgment, either true or false. And the court's not called upon to make its own judgment here. It's called upon to determine whether the agency's judgment is within a broad zone of reasonable judgments that it's capable of making on the basis of the deliberative interests at stake here. here. And here. secondly- I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Where do we have any assurance in the declarations here that the government took this task seriously? You know, and it didn't, I think you didn't have Machado at the time of the declarations. Because um, um, all I see is a sort of general language about here's all these different types of documents. And they all were part of a deliberative process. And so there'll be foreseeable harm. And it seems to me if we say that's sufficient in this case, then the foreseeable harm function will do 
no work, at least in the deliberative process realm. Because all you're going to do is say, remember when we told you about deliberative process? Yeah. Cut and paste, as Judge Walker said. Your Honor, I don't think, so first I want to go through. That, that individualized sort of document um, um, category, of, you've got more than one in the same category um, document, uh, and it would cause harm, not just the nature of deliberative process, always, the argument is always that it chills. Um, I need more here. And when you look at Machado, where the explanation of how the process, what the process is, how it worked, how the input was, how it was used, what the nature of these blitz forms were, went on for like four or five pages in the declaration. Um, where do you have anything remotely like that? Which declaration? Well, first, what we've got in the, in the third Hardy Declaration, I'm at pages 248 to 249 of the Joint Appendix. Uh, this is where the declarant begins the whole section on deliberative process privilege by saying, look, encoded categories B5-1 in the Vaughn Index, that's all the rec 99 records that are at issue here. The FBI protected privileged privilege deliberative materials. Then goes on for, I believe, three or four sentences to discuss the general purposes behind the deliberative process privilege. That's not to chill candid conversations in order to improve the quality of agency decision making. And then the key sentences are disclosure of this type of information would have an inhibiting effect on agency decision making because it would chill full and frank discussions. That's conclusion as to each of the next. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Were these paragraphs written before the OIG report cover, sorry, cover letter was disclosed or after? Well, we disclosed almost all of the OIG cover report uh, in advance of the, the preparation of this declaration, I believe. While well, the case has been pending, uh, I think on appeal, right? right? Correct, Your Honor. Okay, Correct. So th this statements here, though, which are obviously made before your disclosure on appeal, would then have, would have then been defending this OIG cover letter. It, it was a determination, your argument seems to be that there was a determination in these paragraphs you're pointing to here the disclosure of the OIG cover letter specifically, looking at that document, would cause foreseeable harm. Is that right? At the time they were written, yes, Your Honor. And that's because that there, sentence. There, there, that, that, that's that, OK. Now, I, I know you've released it, but explain to me how, uh, how on earth I can trust that this information makes that particularized judgment uh, when it turns out and this is probably why you released it on appeal. It turns out that what was redacted was these words. This is one example that you have since released. OIG report entitled, A Review of the FBI's Use of a Fictitious Associated Press News Article in a Criminal Investigation. That same language had already been revealed in the Vaughn Index. So how can I trust, so it is, how, one, can you just, just tell me how, what foreseeable harm would come from revealing information, you know, a statement, a description of a document you'd already revealed in the Vaughn Index? Your Honor, we disclosed that because we determined, yes, there had been a mistake on as to... On appeal. Yes, Your Honor. I know, yes. but, but and my, my question is very different. You're relying on the Hardy Declaration as having made the Machado foreseeable harm judgment to retain and not disclose that very language I just quoted to you. Is that correct? That's what this hardy language decided? That's correct, Your Honor. And our basic point so, here is- so, No, so I'm not, it's, it's, you made a disclosure on appeal. Do you agree then? That, can we credit this hardy declaration with having made any kind of particularized or careful judgment when it didn't stop to notice that it, what it was claiming as foreseeable harm included a mere description of a document that had already publicly disclosed? Yes, Your Honor, because I'm not aware of any case from this court or other courts saying that one error, an unintentional error in an affidavit means that the court cannot rely on any other portion of that. We had a second one, and that was another redaction you've released, um, where again, uh, the second one you released, where again, the language is just the description of the document. Right, the second one you released. The Office of the Inspector General has completed its report entitled A Review of the FBI's Impersonation of a Journalist in a Criminal Investigation. In August 2016, we provided a copy of the draft report to the FBI for comment 
including whether anything in the draft report was factually inaccurate or too sensitive for public release. That was all already known at the time you're telling me Mr. Hardy said, we cannot possibly release that because it would cause not just general deliberate process harm, but particular making a particularized judgment that that would cause foreseeable harm. That's correct, Your Honor. This case so involves over six, this, I'm this, sorry, Your Honor. You got two times now where this very generalized language protected, supposedly made a foreseeable harm judgment as to something that was already publicly disclosed by the government. Your Honor, this case involved over 600 pages yes, of responsible yes, records. Right. I'm just asking you to confirm that. Yes, I believe those were mistakes, Your Honor. I get that there were a lot of documents here, um, but the question is whether that second look let's call it foreseeable harm, a second look and a particularized judgment that harm not could, but would occur. Um, and there may be a lot of documents, but even I think the foreseeable harm requirement applies in cases when there's lots of documents, right? Of course, Your Honor, but there's flexibility in how- but does, Well, there may be some flexibility, but does it require that there at least be, it wasn't like there were tons, and this is the OIG, cover letter. It's not like there were 12,000 OIG cover letters that you were having to group together as a category. This was a category of one, the OIG cover letter. Did, did you have to make a foreseeable harm judgment as to the OIG cover letter? Or Your Honor, I, I, yes, the, the declarant has to make a determination as to every category of records, not just with respect like to... It was a category of one, the OIG cover letter. Yes, every category is separate in this case, but there are six categories of records just within the deliberative process privilege. There are other exemption five exem uh, arguments as well for lots of other records, not in this, not in this appeal. There were over 600 responsive records. I believe there were six different FOIA exemptions invoked and there were withholdings and I believe over- What is the relevance of all this to the foreseeable harm argument that this, this sort of very generalized paragraph, the paragraphs you said on sort of 248, 249, extremely generalized and high level, um, met the, foresee the sort of individualized and careful second look judgment that foreseeable harm requires it Machado. You're right. It's not just these two paragraphs. I mean, to be clear, I was not able to finish my answer. So there's the paragraph we were just discussing. There's the first sentence on the next page saying the FBI invokes exemption five in this case because FBI employees would hesitate to offer their candidate advice. And then, this is crucial, the descriptions of the deliberative processes within each of the six categories and the roles that those records play in those deliberative processes serves two functions. It goes both to the applicability of the deliberative process privilege, and it also goes to why the agency's reasonable harm determination was reasonable in this case. Machado shows us the way. Machado says that the agency's prediction of foreseeable harm in that case was reasonable on the basis of that the agency's conclusion that release of that information would chill future deliberations. And that is clearly true in say category six in this there case. There was a declaration there that we know at least twice was just false in making that judgment. Your Honor, in a large FOIA case, there can be errors. And so, for instance, a district court can look at a very long declaration, uphold Wait, most of the withholdings. Is this a mistake that they, they had? A, can you articulate to me what, if they looked at the OIG report cover, cover memo at all, if they picked it up and looked at it, is your position that someone could have looked at that, the language that was redacted, and decided that there would be foreseeable harm from disclosure, disclosing that information? Or that if that information had not previously been disclosed, and if the declarant knows that. It had already been previously disclosed. That's exactly my point. I'm not Right, sure. and so my, my so understanding. When they, to make foreseeable harm under your theory, they had to look at it, that they could have made it and it was a reasonable mistake? Or did they maybe not look at it? My point is that it was a reasonable mistake that, you know, at the time, 
the declaration was put together, the declarant, you know, uh, did not put two and two together with respect to the fact that that sentence, that this draft had already been shared with the FBI, had already been disclosed elsewhere in this litigation. That's why we voluntarily disclosed it on appeal, and that's why that issue is moving. Not having already been disclosed. Can you just describe to me what the foreseeable harm would be of this? If it hadn't already been disclosed, what the foreseeable harm of those two sentences is? My understanding is the foreseeable harm would be to open up the hood on the deliberative process and, and disclose to the world that OIG circulated a draft before publication. Now, I don't want to go too far down the road and saying that is the biggest harm on the planet. It is a secret that, that's not what I asked you. Is it a secret that OIG circulates to involved agencies a report before releasing it? I don't think in general that's a secret, Your Honor. I'm not aware of, you know, to what degree every time they circulate, it's a secret. That, that to every time they prepare a report, they share it with the agency in advance, or to what extent in certain circumstances they don't. But just to focus on you know, the six categories at issue here, I think it is beyond clear that internal deliberations about media strategy, whether and when to engage with the media and write a press release, you know, are within the core of the deliberative process privileges, every court of appeals to address that issue has held. Similarly, with the, with the category six, um, you know, we have emails saying, look, these are the current policies, recommendation. This is what we should or shouldn't do with these policies. We black out the recommendation. That's again, within the core of what the privilege protects. And it is beyond reasonable for the agency. I'd like to ask you about these PowerPoint presentations. Yes, Your Honor. First of all, they're, um, so one, one's been released, but there are two more that were not. Are those um, are those two drafts of the presentation that was released? Yes, Your Honor. They are drafts that are two, okay, that was released. Um, and in the Vaughn index, it's, those are, those are um, or sorry, the Vaughn index described the final presentation as um, draft slides, um, but then when they're released, uh, Mr. Gavin's email says that the attached slides were as briefed to the White House. So does that mean that the released one was actually the final? Yes, Your Honor, that's why, that's why we released it. That's, that's why it was released, okay. And then I noticed that the, um, um, uh, Sir Hardy's declaration said that the slides were about, sorry, I think it's Mr. Hardy, maybe it's Mr. Waller, um, described those slides very differently, not about a presentation of existing policy to the White House, but as proposals and recommendations about how to ultimately instruct FBI personnel about conducting undercover operations, uh, which sounds like something might fall within deliberative process. But I noticed that you did not, you have not relied on that description of these documents, nor on that rationale in invoking deliberative process privilege. Is that because there was a mistake? No, yeah. So it is accurate that those drafts and the final presentation were prepared uh, with the idea that they might be used to instruct FBI personnel. As the released email shows, they were also used in this presentation at the White House. Okay, so the White House was a presentation about existing policy, correct? Correct, Your Honor. This presentation is a presentation. An I'm sorry. A, a, a demonstration or an explanation about existing policy is what certainly the final was about. Um, and you're saying that instead the draft was about proposals and recommendations on instructing FBI personnel about conducting undercover operations. The draft was not about, these drafts were not about explaining existing policy to the White House. No, Your Honor, those, I think those two sentences are saying the same thing. Ooh, those... If I say I'm describing existing, certainly for deliberative process, if I'm describing existing policy, one agency describes uh, existing policy to another agency because it's the White House, but to another governmental entity, that means you're describing the final policy, the existing policy. But then this party de declaration, which I, I didn't see discussed in your brief, talks about proposals and recommendations on how to conduct proposals and recommendations on how to conduct undercover operations. No, no Your Honor, it's, it's saying it's describing an existing policy. No, no, these are proposals and recommendations about how to instruct 
including FBI personnel, about existing policies. So for example, if the general counsel of an organization says, tasks a subordinate and says, I want a proposal about how to train all of our people about a certain issue, that person goes out and canvasses all potentially applicable policies, arrays them together and creates a recommend recommendatory memo about how this should happen. That dr the draft of that memo about how to instruct people in the organization is deliberative and pre-decisional as to any final training documents. And again, we've released the final document at issue here. The key point is the drafts of, the, of that document contain deliberative information about how to do that presentation, how to do that instruction. Okay. Um, and then the, on the factual accuracy comments, these are just some more that I have some concerns about or questions about. Um, we have that form in, in the record. Um, can you point me where in the record, because Judge Leon concluded that, that the information in there, actual accuracy, is so intrinsically linked to the FBI's personal recommendations and opinions. Um, so it's those facts that are so intr intrinsically linked with recommendations that they fall within the deliberative process privilege and outside the general rule that facts don't. Um, and where is, which declaration said that they were intrinsically linked? That's the third Hardy Declaration, page 251 of the Joint Appendix, where the declarant says the FBI concluded that the factual information in the responsive records here was part of the deliberation itself and inextricably intertwined with deliberative information. And therefore... Sorry, I'm sorry, I just want to catch up to you. Which page and which paragraph? Page 251 of the Joint Appendix. I'm sorry, Your Honor. No, it's so that's the specific going. sentence. Uh -huh. And... and I think this dovetails with something this court said in the National Security Archives case, which is that when it comes to an agency history, a draft agency history, yes, there's going to be lots of factual information all throughout that description, but the selection of those facts, the characterization of those facts, the choice of which ones are relevant, all are, are chosen based on um, a policy inflected judgment of the writer or the editor. Here, what we've got are comments about basically the same type of document. I just need to back you up. You're talking about paragraph 55 on page 251? Correct, Your Honor. Okay, and so what it says is the FBI concluded that the factual information in the responsive records here was part of the deliberation itself and inextricably intertwined with deliberative information. Um, all he's doing is describing what the FBI asserted. That's what we have to rely on. Well, this is the FBI's declaration, Your Honor. So oh, the no, declarant is saying. I'm not saying it's his view. He's just sort of, which he actually is describing the bottom line position. Is that sufficient? Your Honor, I would read this as the declarant saying that it is true. And I don't think there should be a magic words requirement and that level of parsing. Requirements, because all they've, they've actually, all they, I should think you'd want magic words because they've done the magic words here and said they're inextricably intertwined, but we're given no explanation whatsoever. It, it sounds like instead they just sort of said, here's what we have to say to keep it out. And so- Your Honor, I'm sorry to interrupt. I didn't mean to. No, please go ahead. So I think back to what this court has said about the segregability requirement in FOIA. And very commonly in declarations like this one, including this one, there will just be a paragraph or a sentence saying, I have considered this. And you know the information we have reheld, withheld is not reasonably segregable from the rest of it. It doesn't require the repetition of that conclusion. I'm sorry, Your Honor. We're missing the I. <laughs> Mr. Hardy's not saying it. He's just describing the FBI's position. Your Honor, I on it. FBI, but is, is this, usually the, the clearance says, I've looked at them and I've concluded they're inextricably intertwined. But, so that's why I'm confused. Your Honor, actually, I think you know, most commonly they just say the information is inextricably intertwined. Here, I would most reasonably read the FBI concluded that, that phrase, as the declarant saying I concluded that, given that he's offering this declaration on behalf of the agency to explain why the withholdings are proper. Okay, sorry. And, and just in the segregability point, I think it really is important. It's an important pre-existing requirement of the FOIA. Information that we withhold has to be not be able to be reasonably segregated from other disclosable information. But the court has always accepted even a single paragraph or sentence saying, yes, this information is, the remaining information is not reasonably segregable from the rest. For the same reason, the conclusion about, I consider the information at issue in this case and release of that information would 
result in harm to the interests protected by the deliberative process privilege, that should be enough, especially in a case here where there's so many different types of documents, so many different types of withholdings, it would, ex it would needlessly expend government resources to just repeat the same sentence at the end of each paragraph about each specific deliberative process, especially when the government's already explained the nature of the deliberative processes going on and the role of those records sufficiently to trigger the protections of the privilege. That same information shows why the government's determination about harm is reasonable, again, within that broad zone of reasonableness. That's a predictive judgment not readily susceptible to documentary proof. Okay. Do you, what, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Judge Kat. I'm gonna see if you have more questions. I have to say what strikes me about the overall case is there are the different categories of documents are very different from one another. And your arguments on some of them um, seem to me intuitively or superficially much stronger than your arguments as to others. And, I mean, you know, I pressed your colleague about the Comey comments which seemed to me a, a relatively strong part of the case for you. And you went right, right to category one, but we also have category two, category three seemed to me a lot weaker for you. And I mean, if you're just gonna, you know, we're talking about a category defined as factual accuracy measured against a legal rule that statements of fact are generally unprotected unless you show they're inextricably, inextricably bound up with deliberations. And your affidavit just has a boilerplate assertion. This is all bound up in deliberations. Boom, we're done. That's it. That's... Um, that's giving us very little to work with doing our review for reasonableness. And it seems to me very different from Machado where they did say more as to the particular category at issue and the particular category at issue was much closer to uh, the heartland rather than the periphery of an exemption. Your Honor, on categories two and three, I think this court's case law regarding draft agency histories is very instructive. Again, a history, a draft agency history is going to largely consist of almost entirely factual material. This court said that the factual material there cannot be dissected, quote unquote, from the editorial judgments underlying the preparation of that history. And I think just an analogy to a, 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 a fact statement in a brief, I'm sorry, Your Honor. That, that was all before the harm provision was put in, right? That's correct, Your Honor, but the harm provision, again, doesn't change the type of interest protected or ratchet up the amount of harm required before information can be withheld. It requires a particular judgment that the harm actually would come about, right. and that judgment has to be reasonable. It, it, it elevates the standard, as Judge Millett said, to the extent that a would, would is stronger than could. It seems to require a, a greater degree of particularization in the explanation, right? You can't just say, um, oh, well, histories, histories can be protected, could be protected, and this is a history QED, right? So... And to be clear, we have more than that here, right? So the Waller Declaration says, and I want to make this point, um, my, my colleague on the other side pointed to paragraph 20, but I would point to paragraphs 14 and 16, that's pages 278 to 279 of the Joint Appendix, which talk more specifically about these drafts, where the declarant, Ms. Waller, says that release of that information would chill the OIG's ability to have candid discussions between the subject of a report and OIG before the finalization of a report. So just to drill down a little bit on drafts, what would be the reasonably foreseeable harm in releasing a redacted draft which shows everything that made its way into the final report 
unchained? Well, Your Honor, it would reveal the degree to which the writer of that draft accurately predicted or did not what the final decision maker is going to want to have out there, right? So it's going to reveal the kind of editorial judgments and suggestions that this court said were protectable, honestly, in the heartland of the deliberative process privilege. You know, the opinions in Russell, Dudman, National Security Archive, they don't read as if this is some kind of questionable application of the privilege. They read as if this is an application to the heartland of that privilege. And I think that that's correct. And so, you know, the, the OIG declaration from Ms. Waller says that, look, release of a, a, a draft that's not final shows our preliminary thinking on this subject. And it would chill our ability to have future discussions of this type in the future. That is true. People, in that, it, it's just a, a matter of common sense and human nature that people, when they're writing a draft, need to have confidence that, you know, it's not going to be released in the future um, in order to have truly candid conversations and to think and to improve the quality of government decision making. That's the core application of the privilege. It applies to a draft OIG report in the same way that it applies to a draft agency history. Nothing in the legislative history or certainly the text of the 2016 amendments says, look, we're really going to be working a revolution in the way the privilege applies applies, you know, to the contrary, just says the agency has to reasonably foresee that release would lead to one of the harms, you know, that's protected by the privilege. You know, we've shown why these declarations, you know, pass that minimum threshold. We did that without the benefit of this court's instruction in Machado Amadi. And so if the declarations fall short in any respects as to any particular categories, we do think a remand would be in order. But I've tried to explain why in a sprawling case involving here hundreds, in other cases, thousands of documents and dozens of different types of withholdings in many different categories of, of information, there's no reason to needlessly expend government resources to repeat the same conclusion in each paragraph. And I assume you're, you're going to give me basically the same answer on the factual accuracy category, which is there's some instances where factual statements are bound up in deliberations. And even if that seems like more the exception than the rule, it's enough for the agency just to have a a one sentence statement that um, we looked at all the factual accuracy comments and withheld ones that are inextricably intertwined with deliberations. That's right, Your Honor, but I also want to highlight that that follows from the conclusion as to the draft OIG reports themselves, right? It's because the factual content there is inextricably inter intertwined, cannot be dissected from policy-based judgment, so too comments on that. It's just like if a, a, a senior partner and an associate in a law firm are working on a draft brief and the factual statement in that brief, obviously the factual statements, they're all fact but they're all chosen with very clear policy-based policy judgment in mind. Ditto with this court's opinions and the factual sections therein. I don't think anyone can say that, you know, one person's comments on a draft brief circulating in your court, you know, are not deliberative simply because they involve factual material. It's just like the factual material in a draft agency history and it's protected. I, I, I hear you, it just seems like on that, view of the world, the, um, the amendment is, as a practical matter, going to do very little work, very little extra work above and beyond the exemption. I, I don't think that's true. You know, I, I don't have a, a categorical view of exactly how many cases the amendment's going to really make a difference in, but it's, a it's primarily a procedural requirement that's going to have an effect on the front end. It requires the agency to actually consider the specific information. And even if in an esoteric case, it could have gotten away with saying, well, the privilege would reply, I'm not actually sure if there'd actually be any harm, that's not gonna be good enough anymore. The agency has to, considering that, think, no, it actually would result in that harm. And so you're gonna get more upfront disclosures. But there's no indication in the text of the amendment that Congress thought there'd be a revolution in the way that any of the underlying exemptions work. In particular, the legislative history shows, look, they thought they might want to make some changes with regards to this privilege, I, but they're only able to agree on language as to the 25-year the event horizon. I, I agree with you on that, but it seems 
like there's a broad middle ground between a revolution and a, a here and there screwball case. And I'm not, I'm not sure the, I'm not sure this is designed to just get at the screwball cases. I think Machado says, look, it takes a could and makes it a would. And so on the edges, it's going to have that effect. But that could to would language is about the predictive judgment and the relative likelihood of the harm occurring, not about the nature of the harm or the size of it. It, it, it also focuses the analysis on the documents at issue. I mean, we didn't talk about deliberative process in the abstract. We talked about recommendations by subordinate lawyers to superiors regarding the adjudication of pending cases, pending appeals. Right, but to be clear, you know, the reporters committee filed amicus brief saying, well, actually that case should come out even in Machado. You know, and Machado disposes of many of the arguments you're facing here. It says, look, this really is about a predictive judgment. It's about broad-based reasonableness. It's not about ratcheting up the type or the amount of harm or the nature of the interests that are protected. And the other, the final thing I wanna say about Machado is, the sentences there about foreseeable harm all talk about the specific deliberative process at, in, at issue because there's only one deliberative process at issue. I think this court has always left flexibility for how, how an agency makes out its showing about the withholdability under an exemption in a case involving large number of documents, large number of withholdings. And that's appropriate. Taking together the declarations, the Vaughn index um, and the, the information we've released on the basis of that entire record, the question is whether the judgment was reasonable, not whether the court would have made the same judgment. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Your Honor. We ask that you affirm. Can I jump in with one question? I, I, it'll be short. Can, can you imagine a time, can you imagine a scenario when release of a draft would not chill? And if so, when? There's a huge number of factional scenarios in the federal government. It's a big government. There's lots of drafts. And I could imagine that if, say, the FOIA office gets a request and they go to the person, let's say the person who still works there, and they go to that person and they say, what do you think about foreseeable harm here? If the person literally doesn't care and says that, and if in the judgment of the FOIA officer that that actually represents that, no, 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 everybody that, in the future. I know I said only one, but that's that, the, the chill is the future chill. We're worried, we're worried about chilling future authors of drafts. So it doesn't really matter if the original author is fine with the release. No, and that's where I was trying to get with, with the extension of my answer, Your Honor. It's, it's not just does the author care, but it's also, look, is that the view of basically everyone who fulfills this function inside of the federal government? And if in fact, it's not going to chill anybody, or if the public interest in making the disclosure outweighs whatever the chill would have been, the government could make a discretionary release, of course. But it's gonna be a very fact-based determination um, using common sense and also the government's experience with what people fulfilling this function need to enhance the quality of our decision-making. And it is true that this court's pre-existing case law about the privilege has already drawn pretty strict boundaries about where it applies. And the basis on which this court drew those boundaries even before foreseeable harm was largely about whether that harm would arise if that type of information were released. That's why the foreseeable harm requirement as applied to the literal process privilege is not gonna work a revolution in what's protectable and what's not because this court's case law already did quite a bit of that work. All this does is move the could to a would in the context of a predictive judgment. I'm sorry, Judge Millett, I think you might be muted. I, I apologize for interrupting. It's my mistake, but I apologize. Judge Walker, are you, are you done? Okay, um, I just- I am, thank you. <laughs> I just, um, I'm having lots of technical difficulties today. Um, uh, the government gets gazillions of FOIA requests. Um, are you aware of any so you don't have to describe an example, but are you just aware as a practical matter whether any uh, deliberative process, what would have been a deliberative process um, withholding prior to the foreseeable harm amendment has been revisited and released? 
in the deliberate, I'm really worried about deliberate, focusing particularly on deliberate process here that the government has done, even, even just within the Justice Department. It's, it's hard for me to ask you to know about every FOIA agency and the, every FOIA decision in the government. And I, I have to apologize, Your Honor. I don't have that kind of panoramic view into our FOIA dockets. It's a crazy broad question. You don't have to apologize. I was just curious whether any chance your client knew that they had that no, they were I, a difference. I, I, I don't have that, you know, I just don't want to highlight again the extent to which the privilege was already designed to serve a specific purpose, to prevent the chilling of future deliberations. And this court has been pretty strict about where it applies and where it doesn't apply, even before the foreseeable harm requirement. And so I think that's why it wouldn't actually be surprising if, you know, it has an effect on the margins, it changes the could to the would, but it's not going to work a revolution. Um, my colleagues have any further questions? All set. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bruce. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Townsend, we'll give you two minutes. Thank you, Your Honor, and I'll be very brief. Um, I do want to address, uh, with respect to the factual accuracy comments, just to ensure that the record is clear. Uh, Mr. Busa pointed to paragraph 55 of the third Hardly Declaration, um, which is Joint Appendix 251, um, citing that, that sentence, the FBI concluded that the factual information in the responsive records here was part of the deliberation itself and inextricably intertwined with deliberative information. Just to be clear, that sentence is purportedly applicable to every single piece of factual information that might have been withheld by the government in all the records. It's not specific to the factual accuracy comments. And I would note that the government has taken the position that the factual accuracy comments, the, the deliberative process is actually related to the work of the of OIG and the Waller Declaration, which is the OIG Declaration, doesn't speak to the factual accuracy comments at all. So I think just to clarify that 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 and and to go to the segregability point, I also wanted to raise this as well. Um, segregability is a longstanding requirement of FOIA with respect to exemptions. There's also a separate segregability requirement that Congress enacted as part of the foreseeable harm provision. So uh, not only um, must agencies uh, segregate non-exempt information from exempt information. They must segregate exempt information that is harmful from exempt information that is not harmful. And I did want to touch very briefly in just the last 30 seconds on this notion of, of um, uh, Mr. Busa's um, continued citation to case law concerning draft agency history with respect to OIG reports. I think as we stated in our briefs, we would um, respectfully posit that a draft agency history is nothing left to like a draft OIG report. Inspector generals are independent. They're required by statute to provide oversight to agencies. Agencies are required by statute to provide aid and information to the inspectors general. Um, and uh, even, even the case law that Mr. Busa relies on draws a factual distinction in draft agency histories. Dudman, for example, makes very clear that even if a document is a draft, um, an agency cannot withhold factual material within that draft. And here, the agencies withheld all of the draft OIG reports. And again, as Judge Katz just noted, that case, uh, Dudman, as well as the National Security Archive case, is not only pre-foreseeable harm provision, but the Bay of Pigs case, the National Security Archive case that Mr. Busa cited was in fact, as a legislative history indicates, one of the rationales for enacting the foreseeable harm provision and in particular the 25, 25 year uh, sunset provision. Um, so if there are no further questions, Your Honor, thank you for your time and we will um, respectfully request that it be reversed and remanded. Any further questions from my colleagues? All right, thank you both, the case is submitted. Case number 19-1180 et al. Radnet Management Inc. doing business as Orange Advanced Imaging Petitioner versus National Labor Relations Board. Ms. Cosetta Lammers for the petitioner, Ms. Beard for the respondent. You may, you may start. 
Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court, Caitlin Cassetta Lammers for Radnet Management Inc. Doing business in this case as six separate entities, Anaheim Advanced Imaging, Garden Grove Advanced Imaging, Orange Advanced Imaging, La Mirada Imaging, West Coast Radiology Irvine, and West Coast Radiology Santa Ana, who I will refer to as a consolidated group as the employers in this case. The employers come before the court today requesting that the court deny enforcement of the National Labor Relations Board's underlying orders and request that this court vacate the underlying representation proceedings in these cases. The two issues I'd like to spend the majority of my time on today are the fact that the board has certified an invalid and inappropriate unit in this case, or multiple inappropriate units, and that the board acted improperly when it chose to impound the ballots from six separate elections and to hold those ballots to be counted until after all six of those elections had occurred. There are other issues that are raised. Can I, let me ask about that last issue. Um, sure. It seems to me that if you're right, that the ballot should not have been impounded. And if the remedy is to invalidate the elections that are at issue, that either the first election or the last election still ought not to be invalidated. So if your theory is that the problem was every election after the first was denied the information of knowing the tally of the first, then fine, invalidate all of the ones after the first. But the first was untainted. On the other hand, if, you're, if your theory is that the problem is any election is invalid when its tally is not done immediately, then the last election on the second day is fine because its tally actually was done immediately. So am I right that at least the first or the last election has to be valid? And why? Our argument is more so the former than the latter of the two situations that you posit. But I don't think it's necessarily true that a first election, quote unquote, must be invalidated. Rather, I think we have to take the step, the analysis back a step further and consider whether the regional director had alternatives that would have allowed for there not to be the succession of votes, um, one after the other, wherein each of the votes could have been conducted at the same time. And we don't deny that the regional director would have some level of discretion to make a determination like that. What we but are why, saying- let me, Why, why and you're saying that if, if you win on the merits that the, the tally should have happened immediately after each election, are you more or less conceding that the first election, I think it was La Mirada, should nevertheless not be invalidated? That would require our position to be that the only issue with the way that the regional director sequenced the votes was the fact that the subsequent elections and the subsequent voters didn't have the ability to know what happened in the elections that happened prior. I think the issue is that once you send it back to the regional director and you say, Mr. Regional Director, you have some discretion but in an ideal world, you would conduct these so that they don't fall in a chain. Then I think you have to say, well, I don't, I don't know that we can say that La Mirada shouldn't also be invalidated because the question is one of, could the regional director have sequenced these and ordered them so that you wouldn't have had that problem at all? But so your, theory is, your theory is that the real problem was in deciding to have all these elections at different times? No, the, the theory to be very clear is that the, that the regional director in deciding to have the elections at different times abused his discretion when he had the elections at different times and didn't co count the votes after each okay. election, which so he let, very easily let, could have let's done. Let's assume I, and I'm not saying I do agree with you, but let's assume I agree with, with what you just said. It's fine to sequence them, but it wasn't fine to wait until the end to tally them all. Then 
And let, let's assume I think the reason is that it went against the agency, went against the board's regulations to the, to the detriment of people in, in the later elections who didn't have the information that they would have had. But, so all that's good for you. And let's assume I, I'm on board with all that. Tell me why I should invalidate the first election at La Mirada. Because I think, again, when you send this back to the regional director and say your, ex your discretion didn't extend this far, you need to give this another shot in doing it correctly, that all the elections should be reconsidered by the regional director. Perhaps now that he understands the limitation on his discretion, the region of the board would prefer to run all of the elections simultaneously. I do believe that that decision ultimately is one that the board could continue to exercise discretion over. That's the only reason. Now, from the practical standpoint of what our argument is, our argument is yes, that it is the sequencing and the failure to count that is an irreparable harm to the-, the Can you explain to me the prejudice? I'm, oh, I'm sorry, Judge Walker, what are you done? No, I was going to ask exactly. Oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead. You, I, I was sure. going to ask exactly the same question. Yeah, there are um, two prejudices, and I think a third related point. One prejudice runs to the employees. As employees vote on whether they want to be represented by this union, it's relevant to them what the bargaining strength of that union is amongst these employers and in this region. I think there is a related prejudice to the union and to the employer. And of course I represent the employer. So I would speak to the employer's prejudice in terms of the employer's free speech rights under the National Labor Relations Act to communicate with employees about what's happening in these various elections involving similar groups of employees in the same union. And then I think aside from the question of prejudice, there's also a question of the, the authority of the agency to conduct itself in this manner, we're doing so is arbitrary and capricious. Statutory interest, I assume, is just in a fair election, right? Statutory interest is in a fair election. However, the, the what's act does... Unfair, what's unfair about structuring this in this way? I mean, you know, we have... Um, we have a presidential election in which media organizations agree that they won't release any East Coast results until the polls close on the West Coast, precisely to deny the voters in, on the West Coast the information you want, which is who won some related election. Nobody think that's, un, that's unfair to that California voter can't find out who won the New York election before they have to vote. So why is this any different? Well, I think that points to one of the more central paradoxes in this argument, which is that the board had already affirmed, the regional director for, found, and the board has affirmed throughout, that these were separate voting units. So this isn't one big national election. This isn't one vote with multiple boxes that are all going to count as part of the same result. And in fact, the board does have a history of impounding ballots in those types of cases. What they don't have is any history of doing that where you have separate bargaining units. And these are separate elections with separate bargaining the units. The separateness counts against you. I mean, maybe my presidential election analogy is a little bit off. The more accurate thing if we focus on separateness is the California voters who are picking the governor of California don't know whom the New York voters picked to be governor of New York when they're voting. That's even That's, less prejudicial. It's true and it's not true because I live in Georgia and the voters in Georgia knew what the election outcomes were when they went to the polls to decide about the voters in the two runoff elections. I think the point that we would be making is that there's no board precedent that that mimics or parallels what you're describing as the agreement between media outlets or reporting outlets. Nothing like that exists in the board's procedures. And in fact, they're directly to the contrary. What they are saying is you shouldn't do this. You absolutely should vote, count votes immediately after. There's no good reason for the regional director not to have done that in these cases. And there are clear harms. You had employees who whose names were included and offers of proof given to the board saying, yes, I would have liked to know that information. This goes to the question of this union strength. 
I see my time has already expired. Uh, don't worry about that. Did you have more follow-up, Judge Cassis? Uh, yeah, just one more, which is if if we agree with you that um, the voters have that interest in knowing what's happened in the other elections, would it have been an abuse of discretion to schedule all the elections simultaneously? I don't think we would have been in a position to argue that, first of all, that's what, not what happened. So I'm speculating a little, but we would be, the employer would not be making this point about there being. Oh, we've lost your sound. Or you, you cut out. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Now we cut out about 20 seconds ago. Okay, my apologies. It looks like it might have had to do with Bluetooth. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. So I think the point is that the regional director here acted to intentionally withhold information. He set up relying upon discretion, which was not unfettered, a system that acted to intentionally withhold information from voters and intentionally muzzle the parties to these um, various proceedings from speaking when you, you know, between- that, you've, you've made this general assertion that um, <clears throat> the prejudice to the employer, <clears throat> I don't know that you, you win with showing prejudice to employees, <clears throat> but so you're representing the employer. And the prejudice to the employer you mentioned was, you said muzzling free speech right. That's correct. Is there anything more particular in the record about what your employer wanted to say and wasn't able to say? I think that the offers of, of proof speak generally to the desire to communicate with employees about the results of the election. Well, does he want and to I don't communicate that the union, because you talked about sort of the union's strength or whatnot. So was the point to say, you know, the union's, the union lost two elections yesterday. They're not going to be that strong. Is that what the employer wanted to say? Potentially within the confines of the National Labor Relations Act and what's considered lawful well, let's, let's speech. Just assume it's lawful. I'm assuming. I'm assuming your client wants to do lawful speech. Um, so the difficulty for you is that um, the union won all the elections on the first day. Uh, no, they won all but they all won all but one. Right? What you're missing in the record, and if you look at the board's answering brief you can see that there were elections that were held that are not at issue in this case. If you turn okay. to page 12 of the answering brief. Uh -huh. And you don't have the vote tallies for the other elections, but there were other elections that I believe were held on, on both days. They're not at issue in this case because objections weren't filed, but there were other elections, some of which in which the employers prevailed. Which one was that? Um, so if you look at page 12 of the answering brief, you'll see there are, are units A through, and then you have to turn to 13, you got A through J2. And there, the board here has listed out those units where the tally uh, favored union representation in any other election where the union did not prevail is just listed as NA. Right. But the only, so the other one that might have been on the 24th would have been these professionals in Santa Ana. So it was a totally different unit. So a professional in Santa Ana, it would have come down to the question of a sonotone election, with, which is an election that's run by the board. The election says not only, the employees are asked not only do you want to be in the unit, but do you want your unit to be combined? Mm -hmm. I'm just asking, but so, the, the folks at issue here, the MRI and um, uh, radiologists. Nuclear medicine. Nuclear medicine, thank you. Folks, they would have been in unit J2, right? So... J2, correct, would have been nuclear medicine, MRI. That would have been true for all except, I believe, the Santa Ana professionals. So J1 is the only one who wouldn't have had some contingent of employees who come under the question of the um, question of the supervisory or the, I'm sorry, the statutory guard analysis, which um, so I'm happy to answer. No, Jim, let me, I'm, I'm confused and you know way more than I do. Let me try to phrase it simply. Did the did J1 include any um, MRI or nuclear medicine? Technician? No, I believe it would have been just nurses because the reason it was separated out, we could confirm this with the decision and direction of election, but I believe it was just nurses because they have to participate. Professionals have to elect to be included in a unit with technical employees. Okay. If, and so I, I, 
second point you wanted to argue, I think, I don't mean to cut you off if you have more to say on this, but you did want to touch, I think, on the guard issue. Yes, and thank you. I'm happy to answer more questions about the question of impounding the ballots because I do think that it presents a legitimate issue for the board. However, I do want to make sure that I um, do mention the fact that the certified units violate the National Labor Relations Act because, of course, we don't even get to the question of the impounding of the ballots if this court were to determine that Section 9B3 of the Act did not permit the uh, board to entertain these petitions or certify these bargaining units. On that question, as you all know from reviewing the brief, Section 9B3 of the Act prevents non-guard employees from being combined in units with guard employees. Uh, 9B3 of the Act also defines what a guard is. A guard is an employee who's employed to enforce the um, enforce against employees and other people rules that protect the employer's property and to protect the safety of persons, including other employees, on the employer's property. And there's been some my law clerks are charged with um, ensuring that they don't let anybody in and they don't see anybody else letting someone into secure areas of the courthouse. Um, and they, uh, they have security, at least one of them has a security button in their office to call for assistance if there's a break in. They're charged with all kinds of responsibilities for maintaining the confidentiality um, of information for not disclosing information about uh, that affects my security. So they have a lot of responsibilities on ensuring safety inside the courthouse. Putting aside the you know, is it going to apply right here, but let's assume it does. Let's assume I'm an administrative law judge. Um, are they guards? I don't think they are. And of course, I would urge your employees and you, if you were the employer, to develop a full factual record before a determination would have been made on that. But I don't think they would be. And there's a distinction. The distinction is that you have security guards at the courthouse. And they're the individuals who are tasked with, in the first instance, the application of the security rules. Yes, it is. Where does the definition of security guard say that if there's, if a, so if, if your client had hired a security guard at one of these facilities, if they just hired a security guard, then all of the technicians at issue here would suddenly not be guards anymore? I don't think that's true. I think it would weigh on the analysis because some of the instancy of the role of MRI technologists and nuclear medicine technologists would be removed. But I don't think that at the end of the day, you can avoid the fact that those individuals at those locations are tasked, not generally, but very specifically with protecting the employer's property and also with protecting fellow employees and visitors from the harms that relate to their specific modality. So it is distinguishable. It's not a general obligation to safety. It's very specified. And the evidence of that is borne out by the record that was- I'm trying created. to figure out, this is a, this guard definition is, could include almost everybody. Uh, it certainly, you know, we know it's not limited to my most traditional sense of what a guard is. And so uh, I got that the people at the metal detectors are guards, I get that. Um, but it's a pretty malleable definition. So I'm trying, if you could articulate for me, uh, not in facts here, but articulate the legal rule of the test that you would have us adopt that would distinguish um, why the technicians at issue here are gar guards in a way that my law clerks who get security training and briefing and have serious obligations about keeping court property as well as court personnel safe are different. Just what's a legal definition, a legal rule I could apply in future cases? Sure. And I think that the answer to, to your question has to distill down from board precedent, right? I mean, I could create a rule, but it would be self-serving. So I think what we have to do is actually look at what the board has decided and where they've drawn the lines. And where the board has drawn the lines, there are a couple of, I think, key points. And I think that in this case, these employees meet those key points. You have to show that they are specifically and, per, and specifically tasked with protecting property and protecting the people who are on. Tasked? What does that mean? So I think that, you know, like a general security training where everybody is told, like, this is where the fire alarm is, doesn't quite cut the mustard, but rather somebody who's received particularized and special training 
to say, for example, you cannot enter zone four because your pacemaker might fly out of your body, thereby injuring you and potentially other people. Those are distinguishable. I think this relates back to the board tries to make a similar point and says, everybody, everybody at the facility knows not to let someone in zone four. There's a really big difference between a janitor being told to close a door and an employee who knows it is their job, their specific job to make sure that zone four is approached. As a nuclear medicine technologist, it is your job, your specific job, to make sure that radioactive isotopes that could literally poison the water supply of a town do not leave the hot lab within the nuclear, med the nuclear medicine facility or department. So there's a, a particularized and, and specific safety function that these individuals fulfill. The other thing the board- more question, if you wouldn't mind. Um, sure, of course. JA 201, it talks about um, allowing security personnel into the MRI area. Does that mean that RADNAT does have its own security guards at some of its facilities? The, is it the transcript from the hearing I assume you're referencing? JA 201, it's your manual. JA 201 refers to, it, it, may, it may be the case that there are facilities that have security. These manuals apply not only to the facilities at issue here, but a, a broad number of facilities, I think. Facilities that, issue here have a security guard? There's no evidence in the record of that. And to my knowledge, they do not. I, I cannot recall that. You didn't put evidence into the record one way or the other on that? I don't recall that we did, no. I, the record's quite extensive, but I don't recall. Um, and I was involved in the underlying proceedings, but I don't recall that they had um, security personnel and or any that had these, again, when we're talking about specific security functions, even if there were a security guard, it's my understanding from the evidence offered by Dr. Vartani that those individuals wouldn't have access to many of these areas where these employees are tasked with policing um, security. Thank you. Do my colleagues have any further questions? I have a follow-up on, on that. Do you, do you have JA-201 handy? I can make JA-201 handy, yes. It, while you're doing it, it, it it refers to security guards and security personnel. Is, is your position that those references are to the text? Or, because if not, I think the answer to Judge Millett's question has to be that there are security guards, the kind of security guards we think of when we think of security guards. I don't think that's accurate. I do see the reference you are both making to security personnel, police, and guard screening, and two points in response. One, it's not clear to me that these references relate to security personnel who are employed by a facility or on behalf of a facility. So, for example, police officers might be outsiders who accompany. I, I note that it looks like part of this policy is about pediatric screening, where maybe an, a minor is being accompanied in. Um, so I, I don't think it's clear okay. at all. I get that. The, the other thing I'll say is I'll note that the, the manual explicitly delineates the security function performed by the MRI technologist as opposed to those security personnel. It says the police and security guards have to be screened by the MRI personnel in order to enter. It is the function and the ever-present duty of the MRI technologist to enforce the security of those zones surrounding their work area. And that's that, you know, regardless of the presence of a security officer, that's their job. Um, their duties in that regard, they're ever present. They run in the background of any image they're, they're performing. Um, they, the magnet is always running. The isotopes are always radioactive. It is indeed the case that these individuals do constitute guards. And therefore, this is another reason why this case, the, the, the court must deny enforcement of the board's orders in these cases. I am happy to take more questions on, on either of those issues or, or any of the others that were raised by our briefing, um, but I am over my time. So I would ask for a, a moment on rebuttal um, and I'm happy to proceed as you wish. Any further questions? No, we'll give you two minutes on rebuttal. I Thank you. Hello. Hello. I'm Heather Beard for the NLRB and we're asking you to enforce the board's orders in full. I can start with the guard issue since 
if that's all right with your honors, given that that was what y'all were discussing. The first thing that I'd like to point out is yes, the board has given us guidance as to what the statutory language of 9B3 means. And it certainly is not, if there are other security guards, then we have a yes or no determination about these particular employees. And the key here is the board's decision, the board's decision in the Boeing case, in which the principle that is debated in our briefs is whether or not the person, the employee is employed as a guard to enforce against employees and other persons, rules to protect property, et cetera, that has been interpreted by the board as meaning the regular duties of the employees have to be such that what they do that is guard-like is not minor and incidental to their duties. And what I don't want lost here is what the regional director and the board was looking at is that these employees' regular duties are to scan patients for various diseases. And in the service of doing those scans, what they are doing is making sure that they do it in the best way possible for the patients and, and, the, uh, and for the, the hospital. And in this instance, the record evidence, which again is the burden on the party trying to demonstrate that there should not be, that these are guards, the burden there is to establish that they are guards employed as guards under the act. And here the record evidence does not demonstrate that they are acting in the ways that would constitute guards in a way that is anything other than minor or incidental to what their main duties are that they're trained for, um, which is to do the scans of patients um, and to make sure that they get the best scan that they can for the doctor. To be a guard, do you have to um, have authority over broader areas of the premises, the employer's premises than just where you are doing your other job as well? There's no delineated um, sort of standard. Um, and in fact, the Boeing case makes clear that there are traditional guard-like guard uh, uh, actions that employees are, are doing. In this case, we only have in the facts that these MRI technicians and the nuclear pet technicians, are they do sort of in their own area, they're making sure in the context of their duties with regard to diagnostics that they're keeping uh, you know, the diagnoses going and, and the scans going the way that they should. I'm not aware that it needs to essentially be of either small part of the premises or a large part of the premises. The key here is whether or not it's we're looking at their regular duties. And again, there's language that's conjunctive about protecting the property of the employer. Um, also as against other employees, co-workers. And one of the other things that on this record, again, the burden of proof being with the employer here is very paltry that a regular part of the duties of an MRI technician or nuclear technician here is to guard against employees who would be trying to come in and out with this sign on the door that says level four. And in fact, in that uh, in that jurisprudence, what the board has done, and that's why other employees like Judge Millett's uh, hypothetical about your law clerks comes in, the board has consistently found, the Purolator case, for example, that where employees have duties with regard to security that are no greater than that of other categories of employees. For example, in this case, the manual does say that, you know, folks who are custodians and others besides the MRI and pet techs that are in that area have the responsibility to ensure um, that, that it is safe that that does not constitute then a guard of, of one particular unit here. And so what the regional director did here is important is based on the record that evidence that there was presented made the very reasonable determination here that there was no showing that these employees were guards such that they should be denied the representative of their choice, which is the, the, the union in this case. Um, and so if I'm certainly happy to take further questions on the guard issue, I do wanna make sure I address all of your questions, however, on the tally of ballots. Before, I was gonna say, before we turn to the, the tally, just a, there, there's, a, there's the allegation that someone, the election monitor at one of the sites was staring at the wall the whole time and reading the newspaper the whole time. Um, I, 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 I get that no union election is going to be in laboratory conditions, but on, on a spectrum of like laboratory conditions 
to um, unfair conditions, where on that spectrum would you put the one election monitor is not looking at the ballot box, but is instead staring at the wall and reading the newspaper? Sure. Well, I certainly on that spectrum, I put it um, on the side of, of not warranting a hearing, which is what we're looking at here, if we accept as true what the proffer was, which is what we, what, which is the responsibility of the regional director of the board here. The proffer was that it appeared that that's what was happening, not every single moment of the entire election, but I would put that on in a spectrum lower than a, uh, you know, laboratory conditions violated, particularly here where there was no proffer that either the observers said that there was any problem, that there was any problem that was going on during that case, or that whatever positioning, it was a little confusing in the proffer, exactly what the positioning was alleged of the board agent would not be such that should there have been a problem or um, something brought to her attention that she couldn't address it right away. So on that, it's not a good thing to sit and face the wall for sure. If that is, and, and again, that wasn't even, I don't think the specific proffer that it was for the entire time, it's that she the, that the board agent was, you know, what seemed to be, I think, for the uh, for the, the duration of the election. But we we would absolutely um, are, you know, hear what the board was saying is that even if granting that there was a hearing there, that was not something in this instance that was objectionable. Certainly the cases that there are um, sort of setting forth what the parameters would be involve cases, for example, where there was an altercation at the ballot box, which took the board's agent's uh, attention away um, for, for, for a while, which you had nothing like that here. And so okay. that, that's how we would answer that. Um, I, I, I agree. Um, so turning to the tally, um, assume that, um, assume I think that there are, it's imaginable that the, the board could have made a reasoned explanation for doing the tally at uh, waiting to the end of the two days to do the tally for efficiency reasons, the lack of, of personnel and they just can't be in every place at every time. But in terms of the explanation, they buried that in a, in a very short footnote uh, that seems about as unelaborate as, as what this court found to be insufficient uh, reasoning in the, um, I forget, the real estate one, Nathan Katz. Um, and then assume that I think this idea that a fair election requires you to keep information away from people um, is um, not, assume I'm not persuaded. But I'm, I'm open to this being basically harmless. Um, and, and in fact, it seems like it, it maybe it probably was harmless. So walk me through, I know you don't agree with my two assumptions, but assume those first two things, but tell me how we can still affirm or deny the petition. Sure. Well, it, 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 with regard to was it or was it not harmless, we don't have any evidence here, any proffer here that Proffer here, other than a couple employees would say they would have liked to have had whatever the information was. And we would, of course, say that that isn't a demonstration that there was any harm. So I, I would agree with you there. But in terms of, I believe your first two assumptions were that original, it could be reasonable for administrative reasons. And I, I believe I agree with that. And I'd like to add to that the board's footnote, I think that you're referring to, also does not take the place or supplant what the regional director said in terms of why this happened. And therefore, I would say to you that the way that the board a lot of times does its decisions in footnotes is to say, we agree with the administrative law judge, or in this instance, the regional director. And then the footnote is sort of a supplementary as opposed to the only reason. And so I would say the robust nature of what the RD said is also included here in, in, what, the, in what the board was finding with regard to why it was um, administrative number one, convenient, but also very important that I don't think we all discussed earlier, and I think this answers your question, Judge Walker, the problem with not doing it this way in the regional director's mind wasn't like in Nathan Katz, a general, oh, it would be unfair. It's 
we would like to prevent objections. And that is very important here because of the prospect of delay. A what happens, unfortunately, in union elections that can take place with huge different units all over the place or in big or even in small units is that employers seek delay. They have every right to make every objection that they possibly can. But what this RD was doing that the board agreed with as well as the administrative efficiencies of doing this was let's limit objections that can take place. And in this instance, should there be dissemination in some manner of information that may or may not have been true, varying objections I'm sure um, the employer could possibly think of that would be objectionable, the regional director wanted to do administrative efficiency as well as let's limit the amount of um, objections or dissemination that could take place. And so choosing to do that, there is no case law that has been cited that there is any sort of First Amendment or other right to know at one facility, particularly here, the paradox, let's flip it the other way. The paradox is the employer has been arguing these are separate individual units that should not do one election. So the board is treating them all separately. And as the RD said, paradox here is then that somehow, even though they're all separate for the employer, they now all have a right to know each unit what another unit that supposedly has no community of interest with the others is, is doing. And so, you know, sort of spinning it back to your initial hypothetical about La Mirada, the first one, at that first one, there's absolutely, uh, you know, no effect on that, the one who goes first. And so we'd also say, given that the discretion the RD has and using the teaching of Nathan Katz, the RD acknowledged what this court said, which was, hey, explain yourself. And here we believe that the robust explanation that the RD gave buttressed by what the board said was, was absolutely within the regional director's broad discretion here, fully explained and actually didn't result in, in, in any, any harm that, that can be seen from anything on this record. So here we do, you know, firmly believe his, his discretion was exercised um, in, in the way to balance ad addressing all the concerns, getting all the votes, getting, uh, you know, everything done administratively efficiently and to, to pro prohibit there being objections on this part. So Nathan, I, Nathan Katz uh, didn't engage in any of this kind of materiality, prejudice, correct. harmless air um, analysis. What, what's your best argument for why we should? Sure. Well, I would say that in this particular instance, um, the, the argument would be that the board here was implementing its rules and regulations. And in implementing its rules and regulations, it gets broad discretion. And so when we're looking under, the, you know, we, this wasn't briefed, but when, you know, you're, we're looking at under, you know, administrative law and that sort of thing, if there's a decision, and even if that decision is in some way arbitrary, which again, we strongly view it as not here, then should there be harmless error, uh, it would be, should the error be harmless, then that isn't reason to overturn um, something like the, the results of the election in this instance. And so here we would say that the best argument is that merely because employees may want to know what happened in, in the other elections hasn't demonstrated that there was the standard to overturn an election being met here, um, which is that, you know, there was no free, free and fair election. And I think it's far from that in this case. And I think that, um, so should the court wish to apply harmless error, um, this, this is one of those uh, agency decisions um, that is within, you know, the decision maker's discretion, but that is not uh, done without explanation without reason or, um, or with any harm. So I think that would be the best argument. You have, an, you have a regulation though, which seems to require the board to count uh, and tally the ballots and make them immediately available to the parties. And that seems to, um, reflect policy judgment that more information is better and information sooner is better than information that's later. So why shouldn't we invalidate this just on the ground that it's inconsistent with the regulation? Sure, and I believe your honor is referring to the provision of our- um, I'll give you the site. Sure. It's 29 CFR 102, Point sixty nine a seven, which says on conclusion of the election, the ballots will be counted 
and a tally of ballots prepared and immediately made available to the parties. Right. I, I would say that in the board in this first instance interpreting that regulation has under the independent rice case, um, as well as had the board explained why it was not doing so um, at the uh, end of each individual one in Nathan Katz, this court left open the possibility that the board could do so by explaining it. Its interpretation of that regulation, given all the discretion that the board must give um, delegate to the regional director for purposes of administering elections all across the country, is that in this instance, that was the best way to most fairly vindicate the rights of both the employer um, and the union, and, and most importantly, the employees. And um, that, that would be uh, why this court should not invalidate on the basis of simply that particular. In regulation says count the ballots and make the tally immediately available. Right. And it they're seems pretty categorical. And uh, it, it, it seems very hard to reconcile with any reasoning that, oh gosh, we should hold back information because it might give rise to objections. Well, I, I understand your concern, Your Honor. I believe, however, that all, all, all the interpretation of this regulation that the board has done, even in instances which I'm not sure that even the employer would disagree with, for example, in cases where there's a big multi-employer unit um, and they're doing an election, this kind of thing doesn't happen all the time, but it certainly does happen. And when they're, as Judge Walker was was, was positing, certainly in an instance where there isn't any sort of harm that's been, you know. What, 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 what you're talking about is a gloss on immediately to mean as soon as practicable. Right. That's how certainly yes. That's how the board has interpreted its own regulation. Yes. So what's in, so that brings us to your administrative efficiency justification, and okay. as I understand it, we're we're talking about we're talking about elections with twenty or thirty people voting per election, and at least as the facts on the ground in Irvine suggest, you you have board officials and monitors from both sides on site. So the election's done and you're talking about counting 30 votes. What, what, what's so hard about that? Sure, I, Your Honor, I don't think there's anything um, that I would use the word hard about that, but I would say that given the fact that there would be representatives, that all of the other elections are overlapping in terms, not all of them, but some of them at the same time in same days, who could be present? But, but, but at every site, there are representatives of both parties and there's a board official who's charged with ensuring that things Correct. go fairly. So why, why couldn't that board official just count the 30 votes when the election's done? I think what the regional director was thinking is given that, there, given that we have so many of these um, elections, and given that there's the possibility of dissemination that could be in some way objectionable, and we could have delay, should there be further objections, should there be many objections, the best way to be both, it's not just efficient, but also precl you know, preclude there to be objectionable behavior with no risk of harm, would be to wait until just the very next day after the last election. And what's the idea that dissemination could be objectionable. Sure, I'm sorry if I, dissemination itself of something that is not objectionable isn't objectionable. I didn't mean to, to no. say that, Your Honor. No. I meant- uh, what, what's, sure. what's, what's the theory of harm sure. that's consistent with the regulation that has a preference, if not a requirement for making the tally available sooner rather than later? Sure, there can be um, a host of objections under board case law that parties can make to, to things that go on in elections. And one of the things, I mean, there's a lot of different, um, a lot of different precedents about when one party either says something that is true or isn't true, whether it's a forgery under the Midland standard, if it's not a forgery and there's the Van Dorn standard, which talks about whether or not it's still something is disseminated amongst the unit that is such that it can impact a free and fair election. There could be a number of, of object objections to various things that have happened at the election. For example, in this instance, I think you mentioned Irvine. There could be to what the board agent has done. And to the extent that I, 
that conduct is or isn't objectionable, if it's spread out, if it is something that is um, that happens or didn't happen and rumors can go around and affect the laboratory conditions of the election at different places, that's where the dissemination comes in. Dissemination of objectionable conduct can be a problem. And what the regional director was doing here is balancing, you know, two, you know, 10 different elections on two days with the concern that there could be objections to, you know, to this, what was going on. And given that there, you know, could be that risk in the discretion that the regional director had, the regional director made the determination upheld by the board that this was the uh, acceptable way to run the election. Can I ask a tech, are you done? Yep, thanks. This is a technical question. Is, is the person who counts the votes, the, the board person who's there for the counting of the votes, the tallying of the votes, uh, just the same person who's there on the scene? The board agent, that's correct. And if, if there are no further questions on the tally, I just had another question on another topic. Okay. What does it mean for a union to be affiliated with another union? Sure. Um, my understanding is that if a union is affiliated with another union, they th there's been a vote of one union to of, of their members to to join with the other. Uh, the other union. So I guess I should, this reveals my ignorance of exactly what it means, but what it means for purposes of this case is whether the employees know who it is that they are voting. That's why I'm asking oh. the question though. I'm trying okay. to how you just described affiliation. It sounds not like affiliation, but it sounds like merger uh, into a different No. So I, I, affiliation I, just means we sometimes pool our resources and um, you know, share common information and uh, sort of support each other in different ways, but we're no, still independent entities. One thing, if they become less independent, I just don't have any idea and nobody bothered to explain what it was in either brief. Sure. Well, I'd, I'd first off say that in my limited knowledge, it certainly needs to be something formal in terms of the name, for example, when you have a union and then at the comma, AFL-CIO, something like that. It is certainly formal. Simply because unions share um, uh, resources and those types of things doesn't make a union affiliation. So that, that's what I'd say, number one. And I'm still independent of this machinist union, too. I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? There, there's a, sorry, I don't remember all the names of the, is, is the union that was, was seeking to unionize um, these employees and then it's supposedly affiliated with IAMAW. Um, is the union that was elected, or at the end of the election, was the union that was elected still its own union and its own name? Yes, yes, that's always been the case. There's never been the machinist on any, uh, in any way on the, on the paperwork in this case at all, which again also distinguishes this case from the other I'm cases. Not on the paperwork, I'm just talking out in reality, this union, it's an independent union that maybe affiliation here just means some coordination or shared interests or is it right your honor you know I, I don't know all I'm sorry I don't know all of those answers and I think that illustrates why it's insufficient for the the employer to get a hearing with regard to this given that the employer would essentially be getting the they don't getting and asking questions to ascertain whether or not there was an affiliation that then the employees would have been concerned about such as not to vote there are so many different steps along the way which the board has said over and over a hearing is not for um to suss out that type of speculation it's if, if assuming all the facts that they have they have stated is there a reason to overturn a fair free and fair election and there simply was nothing of the kind in this case so affiliation is not is or is not sort of a term of art in this in the labor area here. I believe it's a term of art. That's my personal yeah. belief. As a term of art, it should have a definition. Well, in this case, for sure, uh, affiliation was never ever a problem. Was never you know, as we point out in the brief, ever raised by the, the employer in this case. In fact, I believe they stipulated to the National Union of Healthcare Workers as the union, as, as the name on the ballot. And so to the extent there is any sort of problem, again, as, as, as I would say, that would that would have overturned the free course of this election, the burden would certainly have been on the employer uh, to, to present facts that would, de to, to, to present a, an allegation that would uh, mean that there had been an affiliation. And I just don't think that there is such uh, the proffer here. 
no further questions, we'll um, give Ms. Is it Lammers or Lammers? Lammers? Or Pestil sorry, my, my vision's not good enough on this little print. Is that a Lammers? And I'm saying it right. I apologize. I'm saying it wrong. We'll give you two minutes. You've got it perfectly right. I would like to use my two units to address some arguments raised by the board. Very briefly on guard status, the board has pointed you to Boeing. Boeing is an opposite. The reason is because in Boeing, the individuals at issue did not possess guard duties that they regularly performed. They only performed guard duties under the statute at certain points of time. I think it was when employee, other employees were on strike or something like that. It wasn't a constant ever present guard duty. Um, and I think the record will reflect quite clearly that these employees at issue do have to enforce their, you know, statutory guard duties in terms of exclusion from areas against other employees and that they do have greater responsibility than other employees. Moving next very briefly to the question of the Irvine election. I think the offer of proof is very clear and it speaks for itself. I'd encourage you to look at it. The offers of proof are, are all in the appendix at 1031. They very clearly explain that the employer's election observer at Irvine literally watch the board agent for the entirety of a voting session, sit with her back to um, the voting box and to the room. The fact that the board- That's just not, that's just not what the proffer says. I, the, it the says that says, she's in a position where she can't see- Sorry, let me, let me read the proffer to you. I think that'll be sure. better than characterizations. Uh, she was seated in a chair that faced a wall. Well, almost any chair in a room is gonna face a wall doesn't say the ballot box is in between her and the wall. And it says her back was turned to the entrance to the room in which the election was taking place, comma, the room in which the election was taking place in the ballot box. That, that, that could mean to me just as much that, that we're talking about the room that has the election in the ballot box, but it never actually, you think if her back was to the ballot, ballot box, it would have said her back was turned to the ballot box, not to the entrance to the room. I think, this well, very craftily articulated properly, I say craftily, excuse me, very carefully, it seems. And I don't see actually, you could read it one way, her back was to the ballot box, but you could read another one because it deliver the one thing it calls out that her back was to was to the entrance to the room. The and that room, sounds like a everything after that is defining the room, which room, the room in which the election was taking place in the ballot boxes. And that sounds to me like a substantial issue of material fact upon which the board was sorry, obligated. Just by, just by vaguely phrasing an offer? Of I don't think, with all due respect, I don't think it's vague. I think it raises a legitimate issue. What could she see? What couldn't she see? The offer of proof says she can't see the entrance. She can't see the ballot box. She can't see the it does contents not of the room. See the ballot box. That's your problem. I, I, I respectfully disagree, it's but I, I do understand. I think your I think your point is well taken. And I oh, think no, the fact excuse that- me. Excuse me, one person- My time. apologies, I'm sorry. Right. Where does it say her backs to the ballot box? I think that that statement, and I'm pulling up the offer of proof from myself here. 106.3 in the joint appendix. I'm sorry? 106.3 in the joint appendix is what I have, unless there's something, I, unless I have the wrong one. No, I think you probably have the, I mean, that should be the only one. Her back was turned to the entrance in the room, to the room, the room in which the election was taking place, and the ballot box. Right. See, that's a clause, a comma clause there that's defining which room. The room with the ballot box. Yeah, that's just the room the where the the room where the election would be taking place and the room with the ballot box would be the same room. Exactly. So in either event, her back is turned to the room where the ballot box is located. She's not even in the room with the, where the election's taking place. Is that what you're alleging? She's either in the room where the election, the election and the ballot box are in the same, the election is occurring and the ballot box are in the same room, right? Yes. If the election is occurring and the ballot box are in the same room. I will say, and wait, this wait, is, wait, I don't want to. Wait, 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 I just want to clarify something here. Is the argument here that she wasn't even in the room? It's entirely possible, yes. Oh, no, no, no. It's your proffer. You had someone who's yeah. described what happened. 
Is that what so you're here's what I didn't read that at all. I thought it was that she was in the room, but her back was to the ballot box. That's what I thought. Well, her your brief. I so here's what I can tell you about these elections, and this is extra record proof, so I understand you won't be able to consider it. These elections took place in very small employee break rooms. Sometimes there wasn't room for everyone to sit in the room. It is entirely possible that this reference is to someone who is seated where if they were turned in the right direction, they'd be able to see what was happening in the room, but they weren't actually in the room. I do understand that the offer of proof is what it is. And I do stand by our position that to the extent it is unclear, given the seriousness of the allegation, a hearing should have been held. I do, if you, if you will allow me um, just a brief moment more, I do want to speak very briefly to the question of the impounding of the ballots. Okay, very briefly. Okay. When the board, when the board's appellate lawyer says, I think what the RD was thinking there to you in an oral argument, it's evidence that the board does not have a sufficient underlying rationale or basis for the action it took. And in fact, the regional director did not give a robust explanation. He said two things, administrative efficiency, which is arguably not a basis, but certainly is not one here for all the reasons we have discussed. There were literally board agents at each of these spots who could have counted in some cases, three ballots and left. So there's no grounds to make an argument about administrative efficiency, no reasonable grounds. And then this question of entirely speculative harm and this, entirely paternalistic approach that the board is going to deviate from its own procedure, which is delineated in its rules to not and not follow that on the basis of some alleged speculative harm that finds no basis whatsoever in this record is is arbitrary, it's capricious, and it's a decision that cannot stand for all those reasons the employers ask that the, these decisions be vacated. All right. Are there any further questions from my colleagues? All right. The case is submitted. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. This honorable court is now adjourned until Thursday, January 14th at 9.30 a.m.